let's start by saying good morning, everybody. And I would, uh, and, and, um, I would like to start by saying thank you for being here at this workshop. Well, my name is Micheline Amar, for the ones who don't know me and for the ones who know me, I didn't change my name yet, so we're good. <laughs> um, I'm from Le Kifshak Pedagogical, uh, from, for the English sector, and I'm privileged enough to work and collaborate with the best minds in the field. I have Vanessa uh, Boilly from the e, um, from Le Kipchok uh, FNI, First Nation and Inuit, and uh, also uh, Giovanna Salvaggio from Gessi. Um, today, today's presentation is really an adaptation from um, a, a, the, the French version created by Martha Francoeur, Vanessa Boilly, and, uh, um, and Louise Roy. And a huge, huge thank, of course, to uh, Jessica Lee for uh, the translation of the presentation. So, so we're very thankful for you, uh, my friend. So um, just to start off uh, by saying this topic is such a, an important topic and relevant to all math teachers across the board. Um, uh, so it's not specific to CCBE or DBE, it's for everyone. And it will be presented over two sessions. Today's session, we will we'll tackle mainly a little bit of theory, uh, the research component, uh, some tools to help the students uh, from a mathematical perspective, from a linguistic perspective, from a digital perspective. The second session, which will be held also the 31st of March, same time, same place, okay? <laughs> uh, like you say, the same station, uh, you know? And that, that's the second session will be more on the applied portion of all these theories in, in the classroom, in, in, in the topic itself. So, um, by the end of this of this workshop, um, hopefully we were hoping that you'll have a better understanding of the reading strategy and how they apply to mathematics. And also to be aware of some digital resources at your fingertip to support your students' reading. Um, in terms of the agenda, uh, of course, we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking a lot, it's, it's, we have a lot of subject to, 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 to discuss today, but we will definitely give, uh, give a break uh, halfway through, well, let's say more than halfway through, we'll see how it goes, um, and we'll be tackling, um, like, for example, the use of error as a teaching tool, the inclusion, uh, We'll discuss language barriers and some activities to consolidate reading strategies. And of course, uh, uh, the hands-on get into action with some technology to, to support uh, these, um, these challenges that our students are facing. We have lots on the menu today. This obviously this, uh, this, uh, this uh, workshop is recorded. So with the recording, you'll have access to everything also. So at the end of this presentation, you'll have access to everything. And for your colleagues, or if you, for some reason later on, you can't find something, it'll be also available to everybody on the uh, national uh, workshop, uh, mathematic workshop. Um, if we think about how uh, we, we, we think of mathematics, I, the way I think about it is, uh, as you may know, it takes a village to bring, uh, bring up a child. So in a schooling context, for me, it takes lots and lots of collaboration among professionals to ensure all of our students' success. So we must not give in to the pedagogical obstacle that our learners encounter. Instead, we must help each other to transform these pedagogical obstacles into didactic solutions. So when we take a look uh, at this model, the idea behind this model is that when a teacher faces obstacles, uh, with any of their students, not only with the difficult uh, with students with challenges, but any uh, any students in their classroom, that there is a team behind you to share the load. So you have a team, uh, a success team to help you. That you're not alone. So a team made up of a classroom teacher, a resource teacher, and a pedagogical consultant is a winning combination to overcome any any challenges. Like we say, three heads are worth are better than one, right? So how many, this brings me to this famous, famous statement, okay? How many of you have heard this statement before? Exactly. The, the irony of the situation is that last night, last night my own son comes, up, comes to me uh, with his physics assignment and he says, uh, 
uh, mom, uh, mom, look, look, I know everything. I understand because well, he knows I'm gonna always ask him about the problem. I understand, I read it, I know everything. I just don't know what to do. And I'm looking at him and I start laughing yesterday. I say, oh my God, I wish I had filmed this moment, this candid moment to bring it to today's presentation because that's exactly my, my startup sentence, right? So when we're thinking about, um, I understand, but I don't know what to do because they almost predict that you're gonna ask them, well, what's, did you read it, right? So um, uh, what does that mean? Well, really in terms of France Caron, who is the, the Associate Professor of University of Montreal, she brought this reflection to light. Isn't that what characterizes a problem? At least at the beginning, before a potentially successful uh, solution or strategy has been identified. Even there, you allow, uh, well, you always allow yourself the right to take a step back. So technically speaking, solving any real problem is rarely a straightforward process. It, it will not be perceived as a mere exercise by the individual. So any problem we, 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 we encounter in life it's never a straightforward formula. It's there's there, you haven't practiced it before. It's there and you'll figure it out, right? So if we take a moment here, take a step back and reflect on that. Let's think of a problem that we may have encountered like outside the classroom in the real life. So for example, if we have, let's say, I don't know, um, a flat tire, right? I don't wish it to anybody, but it happens, right? So, uh, if you get a flat tire, what do you do? The first thing, obviously you park somewhere on the side and you think about it, okay, I got a flat tire, thank God, I'm in a safe area. So you get out of the car and you look, you assess the problem and you start thinking, okay, well, what can I do about this? Um, oh, I could call CAA. Um, I could call a cousin to come and help me. Or I could call, uh, well, is there a mechanic around not too far from where I am? Or uh, I could do it myself, you know? And the newest generation probably, let's Google it, right? <laughs> and figure it out on the fly. But at the end of the day, you have a problem, you found a strategy, a solution to it, and you want to get home, right? So you get home. So let's say me, Vanessa, and Giovanna had the same problem the same day. I don't know. I would have called CA, I could guarantee you that. I don't know, uh, maybe uh, maybe Giovanna has a cousin who's a mechanic but doesn't live far from where she had the issue. And I don't know, Vanessa is the super expert mechanic in her past life, and she was able to fix the problem. Once we, we, we can meet up with anyone and they ask, how is our day? And, and we're able to kind of say, oh, this is the event that happened and actually be able to explain why we went about the strategy we went about, because you know we were able to go through it, right? And this is like, has nothing to do with the classroom, right? So, if we think about it, what does this remind you of? Our famous complex tasks, technically, right? So when we're looking at complex tasks, um, from a, a, what's the characteristic of these complex tasks? When we're talking about authenticity, we're talking about how relevant they are to the students and how real they are. Because when a real problem happens, it becomes engaging, wanting it or not, right? You're in the moment, you have to deal with it, right? It can be also represented in many ways. <clears throat> also, what you're doing in the moment when you're facing it, you're connecting previous knowledge to a new learning, the opportunity to have this new learning, okay? Uh, it also, <clears throat> sorry, it can also be solved in many ways. So there's many ways to, to, to fix the problem. And once you find a solution that makes sense, obviously you have to find a solution that makes sense. You're not gonna like start putting, I don't know, scotch tape on your tire, right? And blowing it. So um, you, you need to find a solution that fixes the problem that makes sense. And you're able to explain how you went about it. And you're able to justify these, these the, the decisions you took, right? So so the similarity is, is it's it's, it's ob obviously obvious, right? So now, okay, we know the characteristic of a complex task. Um, now, someone had asked, well, how well how many complex tasks should I administer to my student? Well, there's no prescriptive number. There's no, there's no you must have. 
one thing we can agree on is that the, the students should not see these complex tasks on a pretest for the first time or on an exam for the first time. So this is something we all agree on. This is, it should be that. So um, uh, some people may use their own formula, but as a, as a suggestion, uh, it could be for every credit to administer two to three complex tasks. So for our typical mathematical, uh, mathematical classes, uh, I mean, modular, of course, if we have two credit, we should look at four to six complex tasks outside our pretests and exams. Okay. And on a side note, uh, uh, the, the first complex task should be explicitly mechanic taught, the mechanics should be taught because a, a, a complex task is not just like answering the question, there is a way of answering it. So the students should be taught how to mechanically write. So they need that modeling component. So Micheline, I had like something in mind since you started in, I don't think we talked about this like recently, but I think that there's something that needs to be taught to students and teachers. And I'm talking, I'm including myself. Uh, we have to be, to accept to be uncomfortable because when you don't know exactly how to solve something, there's going to be a moment when you're like, oh my God, like, I want to know how to do it. I don't know exactly what to use. And we have to leave some room for the students to actually be able to think by themselves, like, what could I use? And of course, we're going to support them if they really don't know how to do it. But we have to be like able to accept some of like uncomfortable zone in 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 order to like produce learning and i had to remind I, I was a language teacher but i had to remind that to myself often when students would come to my desk and they would ask me questions like i want to give them the answers i want to give them a way but if i let them try to find their own ways with the tools they have very often it would be more productive and like the transfer would happen more often so the the goal also of giving them a lot of complex next task is to make them learn to be a bit comfortable with being uncomfortable like I, I don't know I had like this like think I was like that that thought and I was like oh yeah that's something that we have to remind ourselves I think we all know but it's like easy you know to just give them the way to do it yeah and and, and honestly mm -hmm. Vanessa you bring a super important point and I think a very very valid point Part of actually facing any problem, there is an incomfort and a little, like we say, a dazzle of, of struggle, right? Learning happens through uncomfortable moments. It's not when there's, it's comfort, right? And, and to go back to what Francois Caron said, any problem we face in life, it's not an exercise that we actually trained for. It happens and it's by surprise that they take you. And you're actually happy to have the, 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 the training done in other maybe situation that you could kind of maybe link or transfer into that new learning. So yes, uh, uh, like we say, a little, uh, a little pinch of incomfort or, sh or like uh, surprise uh, is, is, uh, is necessary in the learning actually. Uh, Ricardo, Mr. I think. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh yeah, about, about, about this comment, um, I think it's important to be uncomfortable many times because it's part of life. Uh, and sometimes I, I address any problem even having seen it before. And I told my students, I haven't seen it before, let's try. And when I have problems, I think in the process of to solve and to find the solution, because this is another skill they don't know how to develop. It's not only math. It's just uh, helping to, to start uh, learning how to think, how to solve problems, because many kids or many adults, you know, they have a parent who is always solving the problem, and they don't allow to, to develop this important skill is problem solving, which is way required in the private sector. Problem solving is a really important skill. You have to learn and have to see the teacher doesn't know every single question so that's that's the, the that's my, my point of view and that's the way i develop my my, my teaching yeah, i i agree with you a hundred hundred percent 
the more we practice something, the better we're at it, right? It's like tying your shoe. Like imagine the first time you have to tie a pair, uh, like your shoes, right? The laces, how how difficult is it? But then once we learn on a specific shoe, then we have to transfer it to boots and to other things, right? And 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 I think our, our students, in a way, they're also, they need that practice even more than everyone else. It's because there's so much that they're carrying on their shoulder that they're bringing to the plate other than the learning itself, right? So yeah, this practice is definitely is needed. The more exposure you're at, the more, the more you know what to expect, the better you, you, you could handle it. It becomes like, I, mean, I, don't, I don't like to use second nature, but at least reduce that anxiety around complex tasks because the minute, you know, the evaluation, the, the renewal is based on that. Right. So it's it's and unfortunately, it's not going away. So <laughs> and it is actually a good practice for, let's say, uh, transferring skills and uh, across the board. Right. So um, uh, thank you for this. Uh, this this comment really, really um, important. Um, now, when we get to the, the, the planning portion, okay, so now we know the characteristic of a complex task. We know how many we should administer now the selection. How do we plan to uh, to to introduce uh, the the complex tasks? How do we know the right uh, complex tasks to give to whom? So usually, when we're selecting a complex task to administer, we need to take a step back for a moment and just question ourselves to see does it does it match the person I want to uh, like? This, is it a good starting point, right? And of course, we'll we'll adjust uh, along the way. We need to. Um, there's two components that we need, we take into account. First of all, we, we have a few questions to ask ourselves to kind of almost like match the right complex task with the profile of the student. But the second one to have that internal support gauge that we all have. We know our students, are they the type of students that require lots, uh, like I mean that casual support? Uh, are they the kind of students that requires that frequent support or are they the kind of students that require lots and lots of constant support and for these three profiles we need different things in place right so our casual support uh, like we I, uh, like I, I always think about it like almost like a frequent flyer a casual flyer and a constant flyer like you know so for my casual flyer, I will be, you're perfect. Once in a while you come, you make like, you, you ask me the right questions, even if not, doesn't matter. But once in a while you, you're, you're independent, you can do this on your own. My frequent flyer is probably someone who's a bit more insecure or needs a bit of support. So um, how can we say it? Uh, preparing like guiding questions in ahead of time preparing like kind of um, support um, uh, documents or referral to, to kind of just kind of guide them to kind of build their confidence. And um, of course, when we're looking at the constant flyer, the person that's always at your desk, otherwise he would not move. That one is a bit, um, that's, that's someone who requires a little bit more than guidance and a bit more direction that certain other things have to come into place to help them out. So there's, there's other, other um, strategies that has to be put in place. So now a few questions that you may ask yourself um, to select the right uh, complex task is, can the learner read the proposed situation? And we're talking here from actually a reading uh, perspective. It, is the person capable, well, how, how confident of a reader they are, right? Um, can the learner relate the given information? Uh, the, can they relate to the, to the given information on in the problem? And that is an interesting one because I had somebody, and I could give you an example for that one, is like somebody who all their lives lived in, in um, I don't know, in, in the city. And one of the problems talk about septic tanks. Septic tanks, if you lived in the city, you would never know what is, what's the use of a septic tank. And, and only people who lived in the countries will, will recognize that, okay? Uh, so this is what I mean by like, okay, what are they talking about? I can't relate to that, right? Um, does the learner master the process and the strategy approach to accomplish the task? Do the, does he have the skills? Does he know what he needs to do? Does he have enough tools in his bag? Does the learner connect um, the various skills to adequately respond to the task? 
Does the learner have the necessary knowledge? Of course, let's say we're, we're looking at a complex task that deals with exponential functions and the students have still difficulty with the basic algebra, maybe it is a bit too big of a jump. Maybe he needs to kind of build a bit more knowledge before we get to that, right? Um, does the situation allow the learner to develop new strategy independently? The whole idea here, we want them to be confident. We want them to be able to look at complex tasks and work independently to be able to figure things out, right? So these are kind of just guiding questions to help you select to have that student in mind when you're selecting that complex task. So I know I'm kind of opening a can of worms when, I, in your, when I'm asking this question, but in your opinion, who should be re responsible for reading strategy? So here you have on your screen a little uh, survey to just uh, to, uh, to, to like, just to have a, a feel, a gauge of, of how you, what do you guys think? Take a moment and please uh, answer. Whoa, beautiful. So we have, I'm so, so happy to see that all the above is, uh, is, the, uh, is the right answer. Actually, it's, uh, it's not to say that the other, uh, the other options are not. But there is sometimes I've seen misconception that um, certain teacher feels that it's uh, especially because listen I, I I got into math because I didn't want to deal with language right but our our like we say our our vehicle to 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 communicate and to transfer knowledge to have that exchange is the language and the language is about is made up of reading and writing right so that it is it is. It belongs to everyone. It doesn't belong just to, 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 to the language teacher, to the history teacher, or, or to the resource teacher. It belongs to everybody. So we all have parts in that. So yeah, absolutely reading strategies, uh, uh, it, it belongs to everybody. So uh, in reading strategies, you have uh, the, this topic when I came across, and of course, uh, errors is the best teaching tools. Uh, and next year, I promise you, there'll be a whole workshop on, on how we use errors in teaching as a teaching tool. Um, and there, there's actually research had demonstrated there are seven types of errors that students make. Um, and there are opportune uh, teaching moments to see, actually to get into, to dig further on, on where their, their mistakes come from you know, where is the root of their mistakes. So um, in this presentation, we're only going to look at the first one, which is errors concerning the process of uh, the, the processing of the instruction, of course. So it's it's more on the language, right, part, but there's seven type, and we will be tackling all of them next year, I promise, because it's too important uh, for a subject to kind of miss the opportunity. And also, it's, um, I find, I find error is under, um, and they're valued and they're underused as, as, a, as a teaching opportunity. So uh, when we're looking at errors um, concerning the instruction, the processing instruction, sometimes when we're looking at the instruction, if the instruction is too long, most of our students, they, uh, they get lost in the information. They, they read and read and read and it seems like it never finishes and they, 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 they just get lost. You know, so this is one way of knowing, okay, this student have difficulty uh, situating themselves in a text, right? If the instruction is too complicated, that, that you know, require, it's, it's outside, it's, it's learning, uh, it's, um, it's learning skills, like it's, uh, it's outside his proximity zone of development. So that means it's beyond of what he could actually, uh, in terms of difficulty of pushing him, it's, it's outside his learning zone. Um, if the instruction is undertaught, if we're if the, the student's always been taught in a simplistic form, the minute you throw that bone that it's a bit more structured or a bit more complex or more realistic, the student gets overwhelmed. So he gets cognitive overload because he cannot kind of link things together. And um, another another instruction uh, error would be also to teach sometimes. Uh, uh, to, to, to have these mathematical conversation and describing, let's say, a mathematical concept without linking the proper terms to it. 
So like, let's say I'm describing, um, I'm describing function, uh, function, uh, but I'm not using the word function in my description in class when I'm teaching it. When I get to the exam, I see the word function and I'm like, what is this? Like, I never seen this before. So not being able to recognize or connect like, you know, the vocabulary. So vocabulary becomes a really, really uh, important, uh, important also hinder, you know? Um, and this is interesting because I know in the past, uh, also some of the evaluations, sometimes you'll notice they use very specific vocabulary that, you know, you say, well, who thought about this? Like, we don't use this. And, it, and, and it's, it's, it's that where you come in and you have to kind of explain and, and, and give, you know, like you give instruction. Well, you're not supposed to give instruction in, in exams, but you, you're like, you say, oh my God, like, where does this come from? So please be, be aware of that also. Now, how can we kind of remedy or kind of fix or give solution to these kind of problems is to provide short and concise instructions, right? So the clearer the instruction, the, e the, the, the easier that the students will, will get to work. Let's say we figure it out. Also asking students to rephrase the expected task. Like just give them problem and ask them, what in your own word, what did you understand? What does it say? What the problem says? This is also like almost reading something and kind of synthesizing it in your mind, like just digesting it in other words, that you're not reading for reading. Because we know some readers just read, they could say word, but they're not necessarily processing the information. By asking them to rephrase the information, you're actually asking them to process the information, in other words. Um, also, oral instruction. That is sometimes like I have a tendency to do in my classroom. Oh, please, can you? Okay, we're on a we're on an idea, and we start giving oral instruction. Do this, do that, do this. But please always remember to have a written record of instruction on the board for the ones who are, let's say, slower, or maybe have a, a who who have a, let's say English is not their mother tongue that requires a bit more. Uh, time in processing the information or the translation, let's say, uh, in their mind, so they have always access to the instruction, right? Uh, another, another, uh, another idea would be to avoid antecedents. That means um, uh, with the use of pronouns and stuff. So, like for example, prefer preferring repetition. So, let's say I'm talking about Michelin in a text, right? So, I'm going to refer to Michelin with her name, Michelin gender, Michelin as a she, uh, Michelin. So I'm like, I'm describing Michelin five, six times in the problem. And just for for one moment, for, uh, for a student to have a bit of a language processing issue, every time these words, they're gonna get stuck on these words and it's gonna be like processing time on every word. And every time I cross another word, I'm have to, I have to go back in my head and the process have to restart again. And again, restart again and restart again. So to avoid to kind of minimize that challenge or minimize that, that obstacle, maybe just have the same word repeated often. So if I say Michelin once, it's gonna be Michelin all the time. Yes, from a linguistic perspective is not pretty. It's not necessarily recommended, but from for, for the job that I want them to do, I don't want them to get stuck on the words, but more to focus on what I want them to do. So this is something that could probably help to reduce the instruction, uh, the errors within the, 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 the instructions. All right. Now, I get to ask you another question. Um, I never thought about this, but it took, <laughs> it took a bit of a moment to actually, like, you know, when you're preparing projects like this, so you start thinking, okay, well, I'm in math, really English, other than using it as a, as a language. What, it, what do we have in common, really? Other than like, okay, we're using it as a communication tool, uh, reading strategies, writing strategies, really, what do they have in terms of like uh, competencies or whatever? So in your opinion, just like out of curiosity, what do you think a good reader and a good mathematician have in common? And this is based on research, by the way. Just uh, anybody has an idea? Uh, um, uh, I'm going to say, uh, don't you uh, follow uh, a logical path, for example, any novel? Any novel, they, <clears throat> they follow 
apparent, depends of the of the genre. And in mathematics, the same thing is because they follow different paths for different problems. So that would be my question. Okay. Okay. Anybody else has an idea? Maybe they would like to share. Um, I I would. I think patience. If you if you love a good book. You know, you have to you have to have patience and pacing in order to um, enjoy it to its fullest, right? And same with math, you have to have a bit of patience as well, just to to not know that to see that you don't see the question and know the answer right off the bat. There is all the steps to get to the answer, the same as you got to read the book to get to the end, right? Yeah, love it, love it. I think you, it's being a good detective and looking at all the details and realizing what is important and what isn't important and wading through that. Love it. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Michelle. You have some answers in the chat too, Micheline? I don't know if you want me to read them aloud or? Yeah, yeah please, because I can't see everything at once. <laughs> <laughs> so Julie's saying good at reading between the lines. So I like this, everything that's implicit. Uh, Natalie Wood is saying both can anticipate what's coming. So I like the ante anticipation part. Sylvain is asking visualization, which is super important to be able to imagine. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and Tracy made a cheeky comment, but I do agree. Ability to understand text because we're using text in math. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And, and you're absolutely, absolutely right. All of these uh, and more, like we say, but um, uh, we, we've done a table. We, well, this table has been adapted from, from a resource for, for you. And uh, let's look together on their similarities. So I'm going to need you, Vanessa, for this. Good, I'm gonna be the good reader. So I call upon my prior knowledge to make meaning from the text. In math, they call upon uh, prior knowledge to understand concepts and to solve problems. So I'm a fluent reader. I'm a procedurally fluent. I like that. I'm able to make a mental image of what I'm reading. We had visualization in the comments. I like this. So to create multiple representation of mathematic concepts and problems, that's a very important skills in math. I'm able to use multiple strategies. Oh, we're going, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just, uh, my computer decided it's over. <laughs> Sorry, go on. But, <laughs> no, but we're, I'm able to use multiple strategies to understand and interpret a text. Well, uh, in math, we, we also need to use multiple strategy to understand concept and problem solve. I constantly monitor my understanding of what I'm reading. We constantly monitor our understanding in solving problems. It's really important. And then I can clearly explain what I'm interpreting in the text. And of course, uh, our, our, all our new evaluation reminds us of that. We can clearly explain, and I could say justify in this case, uh, our math, uh, mathematical uh, thinking or reasoning. So notice over here, um, we find a lot of the competencies that are in math being trans, well, vice and versa, it's like a transverse <laughs> competency uh, that's found in, in, in reading that actually found uh, in mathematics. So, and it's the same skills, almost like the same skills, just different discipline. And this is of course here, I mean, with Vanessa, we compared a language like, a, like, a, like, English, for, for example, but these skills, you could also say the same thing if you had history, if you had geography, if you had even any, any subject, you will have very sim similar skills that is required to actually succeed in the, in the subject, in the discipline itself. Don't you agree, Vanessa? Yeah, totally. And we also had earlier Jessica saying that we can cope with without understanding every word. And I think this is very important. A good reader is gonna be able to cope with not understanding every single word. And he's gonna have strategies actually that are gonna come into play if this happens. So he's not gonna panic. 
Yeah, and, and notice also from the mathematical perspective, notice that some students also who are not very strong like in, in language, but they, 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 they are very strong in math, they're able to depict other ideas from the learning situation or from the, the context that will actually guide them also. You know, so it's the same thing. So like, like Julie said, reading between the line, uh, having other like other ways of of uh, of understanding what is required is 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 important. And also uh, being patient. I I so I think that is fundamental to any of these strategies or any of these competencies is have that patience, have that, that there is an end to that. <laughs> there is actually success at the end of this. It's just, I need to be patient with myself and I need to be patient with what I'm learning, right? So I, I, I love. We um, have a very interesting question, actually, Micheline, and I'm not sure I would give an answer right away. I'm reading the question. I think I read it twice and I'm like, oh, that's a good question, Tracy. So are those skills required for the subject or the way we teach the subject? Um, very, very good question. I will love to answer it and you will find the answer throughout this presentation. And I'm glad that you're able to pinpoint stuff like that because it's, it's exactly, that's the underlining of everything we're going to be showing you today. So if you forgive me, Tracy, of, of putting that, that, that question in the parking lot, <laughs> just, just for a moment, but I promise you will come back to it later on, or please remind me later on if I did not answer it, if we did not answer it, but I don't want to give it out yet. I would like to build towards that, if you don't mind. So um, that being said, um, let's continue. Um, now, now notice over here, um, how do we prepare for complex tasks? Like knowing now there's the, the, the language is obviously very, very important. Reading strategies are very, very important. Like how, how do we transfer certain skills from one from the reading strategies to the mathematics, right? So obviously when we're talking about reading, reading the problem, rephrasing it in your own word, determine what is requested, activated your prior knowledge in term of like a linguistic part, that's get transferred in mathematics in identify what you're looking for, like question, just what is the question of this problem? Also, um, being able to organize the information, uh, select and organize the right information that you need that is required to solve the problem. I may give you a lot of blah, 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 but which out of the blah, 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 blah is necessary for me to be able to solve what I need. But I need to recognize first, what am I doing it for? It's really, really important you know, to know what is the question. And I notice also a lot of my students, not a lot, some of my students, they kind of, I'm just automatically on like, go and solve, go and solve. Like, yeah, but what are you doing this for? It, what are you trying to do? So taking always that step back and say, okay, I need to know the question. What's the purpose of this? And then, okay, based on the purpose, then I go and I find what I'm looking for, right? Um, also predicting and anticipating a solution is so important and we don't spend enough time on it. And this specific skill here, is 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 also like almost to help you to go back and see does it make sense what i'm doing right um it's not an you're not on automation like we're not putting you on pilot drive like let's go <laughs> you know and oh i've seen it so many times i practice it so many times on, on pilot drive and all it takes is like one thing change in the question and all your pilot drive is all wrong right so to, to be able to take a moment and actually have that conversation with your text, have that conversation with yourself. What is, what do I anticipate as a solution for this problem? It makes sense that it should fall between this and this, uh, you know? And also um, to think about appropriate approaches and strategies. Of course, uh, like in this case, you have to, you have to be trained in many ways to be able to select the right way. Of course, we could talk about our our our, uh, our special learners uh, learners with with challenges. Maybe they need to know one way, but know that one way super well. But make sure that it's practiced enough in different circumstances that they could pull that strategy out and use it. Right. So yes, if you're the regular math student, 
you could you you could you should have in your toolbox many many strategy and hopefully this is what we're aiming for we're tooling them enough that they're able to use these strategies in different times different situation but if you're not that's like let's say uh that uh, i don't like to use the word strong if you're that student who have let's say challenges uh, well, you know what? I'd rather that you learn one very, very well and know how to use it in different circumstances than not have that I teach you many and you don't know what to do, right? So again, these are all things you have to keep in mind. We have a student in mind and we adjust these to that student, but be able to tool that student at least with one solid, hopefully many, but at least with one solid strategy. Uh, and of course, making links to prior situation, right? The fact, like we started off when we said at the beginning, the more exposures they have, the more their prior situation become a bank, you know, a bank where they could draw and they could connect to. So the more they'll be comfortable in facing situation, you know, the first time is always the hardest. Then the more I, 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 I get exposed to something, the more I become like that, that first anxiety wears off and I say, okay, it's uncomfortable, but I'm okay. I can do this, right? And hopefully that's what we need. Now, when we get to also in terms of processing and in execution of the task. So here, when we're talking about reading, we're talking about relating the, the content of the text to the knowledge. So there's a here, there's a co-transfer between like the language and the mathematical concepts. So have to, through the reading, you're, you're, you're thinking about that. The selection of ideas and data, uh, important uh, ideas and data identifying relationship between part of the text. So in term of like just context, in term of words, certain words may be said in the first, let's say paragraph that the third paragraph are talking about and say, oh, they're talking about this. So I'm linking these words together, uh, creating mental images. It's almost like closing your mind, uh, closing your eyes and seeing that little uh, like video in your head, you know, of this is what's happening, creating that, that like uh, mental imagery. Uh, visualization, asking questions like, okay, well, they gave me this and they gave me, but what about this? What, like having that constant, like conversation with yourself when you're working with a, with a complex task and choosing strategy to overcome obstacles. Okay. You may have issues like, okay, I read the text and it doesn't look right. I don't get it. Maybe using the strategy of, okay, let me reread it again. Okay. Let's think about, okay, let me start with the question, um, the question and work my way back. So finding strategy that will help me in the reading, uh, from the reading part to get myself situated, right? So when that gets transferred to the mathematics, of course, we're talking about uh, uh, verifying your, uh, your initial prediction. Well, I thought I needed to find this now with rereading, with rethinking, maybe I should need to adjust my, like my anticipated answer maybe was like a bit off. Um, eliminating extra information to be able to say, okay, I have too much here. Uh, I, I just need this, 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 you know, for, for my problem. Also being able to, to recognize implicit um, or missing information. Obviously uh, not all problems are complete and be able to be critical and saying, okay, for me to be able to solve this, I need this, this, this. Do I have this information? Can I find it from the text? If I don't, can I solve it? Can I find it through other methods? And if I can't, then to be able to say, well, this problem doesn't work because I thought of this, 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 but I wasn't able to find, I'm missing this number to be able to use this strategy. So having that kind of level of, of, of thinking, reasoning is amazing. So we have a comment in the chat from Julie Vallée who's saying to visualize, sorry, we can draw. And I really like that. Absolutely. Visualization is, is, is putting meaning to words, right? And so, so that could be imagining, could be drawing, could be any, in any way that you find fit. And we're going to see later on, we're going to get to like certain tricks on a, on, in a problem that you may have to include that kind of also support the, the, the learner too. Uh, yeah, please. That's a very, very good uh, point. Thank you, Julie. Uh, also, um, one more uh, point in terms of the mathematics is to actually be able to, to find relationship or connection between when we're looking at text words and mathematical concept. Of course, like when we say as much as, what does that mean in math? Like, 
oh, the sun. What does that mean in math? You know, so making that vocabulary, not only vocabulary, but more word connection to something, to the language of math, really. That's what we're doing. We're translating, really, <laughs> from words to something more numerical, right? More conceptual numerical. Uh, modeling the problem you know, model the problem. So, oh, I remember I've seen this before. Okay, let me like, you know, like, like Julie said, like, uh, sketch something and, and use that sketch to make sense of things. Um, and also, in this case, also to identify sources of difficulty. Well, where is my issue in, in solving a complex task? Is it really reading? Is it really that I don't have enough strategy? Maybe the problem requires to use Pythagoras, and I don't know how to use Pythagoras. So this is a problem, you know, or, or how do I approach? Maybe I have problem identifying a question or maybe extracting the information that is required or maybe just, you know, so going through those kind of questioning will help you know where you need to kind of, uh, where's the cap, where's the hole to, to, to make that student stronger to be able better solver. Um, anything else, maybe Vanessa? I think you... that uh, Mr. Sanchez had a comment, but he removed his hand, so I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, yes, about the drawing. I always uh, tell my students, use the imagination, do a little drawing, but um, I have been successful because they have problems to even imagine put it in, in, a, in a little drawing. And in many cases, it, it doesn't happen because I just, even I give it examples, ideas <clears throat> many times, and so far it works in only a few people. And sometimes it takes several classes before they start, start doing it. That, that's my experience. I, I agree with you. I, I agree with you, Mr. Sanchez. Uh, I think, you know, what you're doing is for the students who have difficulty, or maybe sometimes they just don't know how to do this. But, and I agree with you, like, let's say this is where the opportunity is when you're modeling, when you're giving suggestion, when you're providing ways, eventually if they see it enough, they hear it enough, it becomes almost like the way to go. But you're absolutely right. A student will not automatically start imagining and making scenario. And it's not everybody that works that way. Remember, we're all different. So I think the opportunity to, uh, the, the idea behind it is to provide a way that could work to some to reach people differently, right? And we try things differently. In a classroom, we're always trying new things. And 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 I know in in one of my classes in the past, I was showing one way first, one way of solving, like for example, uh, based on what you just said, uh, one way of ex uh, of solving something. And then I say, for everyone who are comfortable with this and don't want to know nothing about the rest, like close your ears. If you're able to look at other option, this is another way of solving. This is another way of solving. But it's just to make sure, like sometimes, like we say, if we give too much, it becomes like confusing for students. But just to name it, to, to tell them, look, there's many ways of doing the same thing. Now it's up to you to pick the one that works for you. But also be careful, there's a pitfall also there too. If we get too comfortable with one way, again, I'm not talking about students that have, um, the, the um, student that requires uh, uh, like the one strategy, right? We're talking about everybody else. If, if those students are like so comfortable with one way that they're gonna use that one way for everything. And sometimes that limits them in, in expanding their learning. So we have to have the right doses, like we say, <laughs> sometimes showing just one method or two method or three method and see how different students take it. They might say, oh, I, I learned it this way, but I like this one better, right? But again, you have, it's, it's, a, it's all about exposure and all about communication and open communication with the students. If the student tells you, well, I never did it this way. I'm not telling you like, like oh, uh, let's do a yoga meditation class. Okay, close your eyes and imagine there's a car and it's No, <laughs> I'm just saying, for example, the more exposure, more tool we provide the student to some students, uh, the better their, let's say, toolbox become. But you're absolutely right. At the beginning, sometimes when you say stuff like, imagine this, and they might look at you and like, what are you talking about? Yeah, absolutely. I have to kind of probe. I have to kind of give ideas, you know, guide. Very, very good point. And Michelle, I think it's also showing that we are competent. 
And it's like, not just in math, in everything. If we are competent, we have different tools that we're gonna use in different circumstances or situations, and we're gonna be able to pull out the right ones. So I think this is just being competent and it relates also to Tracy. She made a comment, she said, we can also relate that to teaching. If we only rely on one way, we can limit ourselves. And also we're gonna limit the students we're gonna help to be honest, because not all students are gonna want the one way I prefer, they're gonna prefer their own ways and sometimes their ways is better too i don't necessarily have the best reading strategies for them they have the best strategies for them so i can teach them all of the strategies and see what works with them um, and we also have sonia saying that she can go through a math problem without drawing drawing it out like she has to draw it and if she does she has to model this in the classroom and say look me i'm like that when i see a problem i draw it i'm going to show you how, I, how i do it and then you want to try it and does it work for you yes no and we adjust so i like mm -hmm. this all these comments are relevant thank you guys yeah and 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 i love one thing i want to just kind of i know I'm, I'm ahead of myself by bringing this this comment up just remember teachers are not necessarily and i'm not talking about everyone i'm talking about the majority of teachers are not let's say the strugglers in learning right so this keep that in mind our students sometimes they're in different places because uh, and they're 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 facing different things because we it doesn't mean if we went we didn't go through it that the the uh Sometimes it's hard to connect to where the issue is because our, we did not have it ourselves, right? So having that sensitivity of also remembering like, like for example, like uh, like Sonia, I'm like that too. I, I have a tendency to just like to, to draw things, to, to do things mentally by hand. So if I have to teach the way I learn, it's it's a disaster because I am I, I have my own way of doing things, right? So uh, yeah. So go Sonia, yes. I just wanna take two minutes to share uh, an experience that I had many moons ago when I started teaching at PAC. Um, the whole school, every classroom, they installed smart boards in every classroom. And so I was teaching trigonometry and trying to learn the smart board at the same time. And I was, I was um, always the type of teacher that I wanted to prepare my drawings beforehand, if I was going to correct some homework on the smart board, I would prepare the drawings beforehand so that the students didn't have to wait all day for me to draw them. One day I couldn't do that. I just didn't have the time. So I was, I started uh, draw, we were reading the problems together and I started drawing them on the smart board, but I was still figuring out the tools. And so the students were coaching me and, you know, use this tool, it's that line, or I was looking for the dotted line instead of the solid line. And then I realized in that they were paying so much attention to me trying to figure out the smart board and drawing the image of related to the problem that they were, they were really understanding the problem. They were learning more <laughs> when they were watching me draw it as opposed to me drawing them beforehand. So it was just this great realization that I had as a teacher. Sometimes we want to go in and we want to be so over, like we over prepare often. And in that moment, I realized these guys are they're learning more because they're helping me figure out the smart board and we're drawing it together. And then eventually some students just, I realized they would be better than me on the smart board and they came up and did the drawings, you know? So it was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. For Thank you. Oh, no, no. Thank you so much, Sonia, for this, because this brings me to a point that sometimes we skip a step thinking that we're doing them a favor, but actually we're, we're skipping a step that, they did not learn because, well, it's not intentional. Like you just said, like you're, you're just that kind of teacher prepared, right? I did so many times the same thing. You know, I come in, it's already done. So look, guys, read this. It's over here. You know, the problem says this and it's over here on my picture. And I'm guiding them so much. Then by the end, the, the struggling part, like you said, and you, it was a technology, which would be my case all the time, regardless, you know, so that part was fun to them, for them to see that, oh my God, my teacher is a human being that could make mistakes, that needs my help once, even though she knows more than me, but it's a, that interaction. I think sometimes we kind of take it for granted just because in the purpose that we want to teach, right? We want to go f faster, give them more, and we skip those subtleties. Thank you so much. That's such an interesting point. 
we have a, a new, I, I wouldn't say a new topic, but a new question in the chat, Micheline, I'm going to read it to you, Juan. Uh, it's Michelle who's saying, I have a few students who have a really hard time when they see a question on the pretest or the exam written in a different way. They seem to only be able to mentally enrolling it one way. So should we, in essence, be giving them a preview or coaching them on how the question will be phrased in the exam? So Natalie would said, interesting, and Julie Valley was saying that's what she does. Uh, I try to use the same wording over and over again in my exercises, so it is common to them when they get to the exam. So I don't know if you want to... Um, okay, the, the, the exams, the exam is a different beast. I like to say that. Just be careful. Um, the exams, they're evaluating a competency. They're not evaluating, um, like, how do you say, it? reading skills or this. So I personally think, of course, it, 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 that's the, that's the even Martin who, who was talking about exam last time he goes even at the ministry level they get a lot of feedbacks about words that are used in the exam and they're like what do you mean they don't know this word oh this word means many things oh I didn't get I never thought about this word in this context meaning many things or student could take it that way so there's that constant struggle with these vocabulary use is 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 a is is a is a is an issue really so yes i would agree i would agree i have a tendency to agree with with julie i think we would like to reduce as much as possible the obstacles that is like what we call technical more uh versus uh the reasoning versus what we're really we're looking and looking for is how if they could actually demonstrate uh, their reasoning process, are they equipped with the way of thinking, how they go about solving something, then they get stuck with words, right? So obviously, like if, if there's specific words used um, on a test that obviously they should have seen them in class, it shouldn't be the first time that once we get into an exam that we see all these new terminology, because I promise you, we will be stuck if you have somebody who's very, how can I say, uh, detail oriented, we'll be stuck on every word. The first like uh, research, how, actually there's a research that I, I read somewhere that says um, as, a math, uh, as a math student, I may get come across the first word and say, okay, it's not too bad, I don't know it, but let me see, let, look further. I may see a second word, I'm gonna start panicking, by the third word that I don't know, I'm gonna quit. I'm gonna just my mental, my 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 mind gonna just stop solving because there's too many words in this problem that I cannot connect or understand. So that means I'm not getting it right. And this is and this has been actually documented. So to reduce that anxiety, of course, there we cannot predict every single word on the test that they'll know, but we'll try to minimize that. So vocabulary again. It's really important uh, to uh, <laughs> to kind of go over in class, you know. So that's why, again, uh, paraphrasing um, keywords. Yeah, Mich key. Michelle yeah. was saying it's not just the words; it's also the phrasing. I, I do agree with that. We have something. It used we used to have something in the math exam saying like knowing that blah 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 blah. Now can you? And it's such it's such a hard sentence to understand so he has to pick up what's very important and then link it to something else which is implicit so these sentences were all over the maths complex task and it has been a bit reworked on because it was really a, a big struggle so it's not just words sometimes it's typical sentences are very hard. And if they are still in the exam in maths, I just know the French math exam, I'm gonna be honest. Uh, if they are still in the English math exams, I think that yes, they have to be familiarized with, with these type of very complex sentences. We don't, we can't go around it because they're not gonna be able to make meaning out of them. But Jessica, yeah. Jessica put a very good point. She has a handout. It's like different ways to say, you know, because like you said, when they encounter a new structure, it's like mm, difficult to extract the, the information. Okay. This yeah. yeah, but uh, but you know what? This is it brings it to a very interesting point. Again, the mechanics of reading a, 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 a task 
is this is part of the mechanics right asking the question so maybe uh, i don't know another way uh, another idea of, of of working on this is actually ask giving them a question say how many other ways can you ask the same question or you providing them like five questions that ask the same thing and say you see this this is five type this is five different ways of asking the same question or do the other way around. If I want to ask about this, can you tell me different ways I could ask about it? So let them like start off the conversation and say, well, what do you think about that? Have that conversation through conversations is the best way to actually link something, right? Providing documents, they've seen documents kind of coming like out of their I'm not going to use the word yang yang, but yes, you know, because that's in an individualized setting, that's all they do. They have a book, they have to read and read and read and more handouts on reading and reading and reading. But having that two minutes of having these conversations saying, okay, let's take a look at the question now. Okay, what do you understand from this question? Can you rephrase it in your own word, right? But give them different type of ways of asking a question is as much as a mechanical training than as 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 actually solving right so i i personally i these are things i did not think about before that now i'm like the more i reflect i say well of course if they've only seen one way of asking a question they're so used to like what is this or how much is that or you know that the minute they see a different format they're like what do they mean you know especially again for the ones who are not as proficient in the language as as others, right? Yeah, so I was typing there, I guess, like, I'm not sure how, what I'm trying to ask, but so, um, you know, that there's some students who they're so fixated on, oh, math should not have so many words. I hate word problems. I can't do word problems. So I try to talk them through that, like, yes, math does have words you will encounter and you just have to take that leap. It's just a matter of taking that leap and, tr and, and just learning how to deal with it. So I show them tech, um, strategies like, you know, pulling out sections, rephrasing. I say like, you see the numbers, pull out the numbers, put it into tables, like sort out your info, what you have, what you know, what you need to know. And then it becomes more clear to you. But I think I notice, especially with the weaker ones, and this is what I'm struggling with right now, is that, well, first of all, it's a matter of their self-confidence. They really lack it and, and have being able to put that into them is a difficult thing. But also, like I, I do notice that even though they have seen these questions written in many different ways, and I tell them rate per uh slope all these things mean the same thing if they see things kind of like they're they're like it's it's like they have a hard time linking the real world situation to the math they're mm -hmm. seeing them asking the question tell if oliver and david are asking for the same price they're like and and, and I, I feel like i tell them over and over but they just like there's that block where they're mm -hmm. like, I know the math, I know everything. You know what you just said in the beginning? I hear that all the time, Michelin. I know what to do. I know the math. It's like, I know it. I really know everything, but I just don't know what to do here. I'm not, not too sure if you could just, you know, but I know everything. Like I know what to do, but I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I, I mean, it's, I guess it's that initial, like I've tried many different ways I've, I've done the handouts I've done like I give them a word dictionary like I, I you know these are the words look at it what does this mean how does this translate but maybe it's just I guess like a boost confidence thing or how do you deal with it when they actually like maybe I, I don't want to say this but cognitively their their reading level and understanding and interpreting is at such a low level so that they're like they're in a language arts and they're in your class and there is this reading and they already are struggling with the language part 
So, <laughs> sorry, I just have a few students no, no, no. like that I, right I, now, I, and I'm trying to figure out what to do, how what? to get them, and they seem so sad all the time. You know, they seem. <laughs> I mean, I just, <laughs> they come and they're like, when 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 they come to me, like I think I got this one, and they do it, and it's all wrong. Yeah. So I say, well, that's a really good try, but so this is where you went wrong, and then they're just like, oh. I thought I had it, but I guess I don't. I, yeah. I, no, I just like, I've been struggling with that a lot recently. And uh, well, I, I feel so bad for them, but I, I'm like, I don't know. No, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't cry with them or anything. I try to still encourage them, but it's just like, I don't know the right words. I, I can't find the right words to say or, or show. Yeah. Anyways, no, I, anyway, that's just no, no, no. I hear you, Michelle. And this is a, this is a question. This is a, a struggle. You're not the only one in this. Trust me on that. There's we're all in it. When I was in class, is the same story. And it's not only in math. It's in physics and in all subjects. Trust me. The the one trick. Okay, again, this is we're gonna look at the application part in the second part. You'll see there's a lot of cues that might help. But one thing I always do with the students, I say, okay, talk to me through your reasoning, go through it and let's see where is it failing, right? So maybe having that conversation, instead of you saying, this is where it went wrong, maybe have them explain it to you. But sometimes when they hear themselves explain, they might figure it out. And I've seen that in the past, you know, I promise you <laughs> that could work. Another thing, one workshop we'll be putting together for next year. And I, I, I personally, I'm like, so excited for it is learning math through experience so that means actually bringing math to life because you're right there's a lot of students who have difficulty to connect real life with these word problems and having maybe uh not a simulation but starting off with maybe an experiential um event like for example okay some stuff you can do some stuff you may have to just take a clip in a movie or whatever and like start to have that conversation based on uh, 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 something they could relate to and transfer it only at the end into words, right? So we will be looking at experiential math as, as a hands-on way of teaching. Maybe in, 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 in I, next year, I promise this is something that it's been on my mind for a long time and I've been starting to look at, but it will be there for next year. But having the student guide you through their reasoning, it could be a nice way of having that conversation. And also to give you hints, where is it really, um, where does it fall? Where, where does it fail actually? And a student who's weak in language art and weak in work, like in just language in general, this is a good opportunity to work with the language art teacher to see, to see if their whatever strategy is done in the language arts, it follows that in the math or actually across the board, because once it's the same language, the same strategy following them, you're reinforcing this strategy across the board and the student will have no choice, again, based on exposure, based on patience, based on repetition, in that specific case, will only get the students to use it. So I don't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to address some really, really good comments that were put in the chat in particular. So Jessica suggests, well, what she does is she asks the students to focus on the graphs and the tables first before the words. And Tracy brought up just what you were saying, that there are teachers um, in different subject areas that were sharing strategies. Uh, so English and social studies teachers they were using the same reading strategies. So this could be interesting to apply like this cr cross-curricular approach to this, this, um, this challenge. And um, yeah, Judy says that drawing for her is key. Uh, even if they draw stick figures and bananas with their hands, this is a way of uh, visualizing it. Yeah. Uh, usually once they draw the cartoon version of the problem, it helps. So yeah. yeah. So there's pretty cool uh, strategies that have been uh, shared. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanna. Um, Ricardo, sorry, thank you for being patient. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, well, one of, the, one of the things I do is to have these comments. Um, when I talk about uh, work problems, I try to find, you know, funny things. I do, for example, monkeys. Or, yes, um, drawings. So, but then it's easy to, see, uh, to figure out that more than the drawing. 
And another thing is about the validate uh, solution or communicated solution. That's another problem the, the, the student uh, have because because in the past, for example, an answer would be, for example, area is equal to 20 square meters. Now they have to validate it, they have to express, uh, you know, you will be able to buy this kind of material or no, or uh, uh, option A or B. And that's uh, another problem with the language, how to communicate the solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very, very much. You also made me think of also giving a wrong answer and asking the student to kind of say why. So maybe work the other way around, right? So instead of the students always getting the wrong answer, sometimes you can start with like, look, somebody gave me this and it's wrong. Uh, what do you think? Why is it wrong? And get them to work out the nicks and knacks like in the problem. So, so instead of always them feeling that they, they, they can't succeed, work the other way around, say, okay, well, how would you be able to help somebody? Like, let's go over it. Let's work backward with this, you know? Sometimes just rephrasing a problem, right? But thank you. Yeah, you you, you generated lots and lots of great ideas. Thank because you. Sometimes it, it, it takes for them even longer to express the, the solution than actually even reading the, 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 the problem. I always challenge them all the time. Absolutely. Why, uh, and, Right. Absolutely. Thank you. That's 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 why we're here, right, uh, Michelle? Excuse. We. Uh, I have sort of like two two question a question a comment. The first one is is that um, I've I had a student that did an exam in secondary two and the three tasks uh, complex tasks and one they did absolutely brilliantly and and was really impressive and the other two like zero. They just could not do that. So is that an explanation of the, the ability to not decode the language or the cultural reference to it, like from something like you said, the septic tank. So from having to bake something for a young guy who has never cooked or doesn't understand any of that. So that was like a real like eye opener for me because obviously he could do the complex task in general, but then couldn't transfer that to the other two. So that was shocking for that young person because they didn't pass that exam. And so then my second thing is like, we have a couple exams to select. Is it appropriate to like, look at the vocabulary of a specific exam, like you said, match it to that student and then help them understand the vocabulary as opposed to what the math question is, but just the general vocabulary. I don't know if that's a loaded question or if that's appropriate, but you know, I know it's not teaching to exam, that's not my intention, but when you're talking about vocabulary for us in this area, we get a lot of questions that are more related to like the city and situations related to that. So um, yeah, so help. <laughs> I don't know, I think, I think, well, first of all, I think personally being able to choose the exam would be an ideal thing, but it's not necessarily uh, permitted. So yeah. That, that part. However, again, it's the same thing as like we're teaching to the program or we're teaching to the evaluation. Again, ideally we're teaching for everything, right? So um, from a more applied perspective, I would look throughout the three exams, all of my exams, and I'll extract all the vocabulary that I think could be potentially an issue and use yeah. those, this, this as a pool of, of vocabulary, let's say, to use in practice in class, right? Again, we're not we're not teaching the exam, we're not teaching the concept. We are teaching the mathematical concept, but we're not teaching the exam, right? But we're reducing the obstacles to be able to successfully uh, demonstrate that we have this competency. That's the idea. So if the obstacle is a vocabulary, it's a word, then we need to have that address because this is not the purpose of these exams. It's not to check if I understand the word sum or difference. It's more like to go through the reasoning of demonstrating a, a, a skill, a process of going from like uh, from uh, like you're solving a problem, right? So the problem is not only words, right? It's it's actually a problem, a mathematical problem. So if the word is an area that you need to work more with your students, then you know what? This is something maybe you need to work more. And you'll see there's lots and lots of great, great tools in the part two for that specifically that might help the students and um, you'll have access to. Uh, but uh, 
but yeah, first is, and also you're absolutely right, cultural references, context, those are super important, right? We're not, again, we're not saying go through the exam and say, okay, well, they're talking about this and this and this, but more like look through everything and say, okay, uh, you know, like just one, uh, like for example, septic tanks, trust me, I was so surprised with that word personally that it's stuck in my head till this day. You know, whenever I'm teaching, let's say science, I bring it up in casual conversation. So at least, they have an idea what it is. I even like, you know, uh, like, uh, of course it's not directly aimed for that, but I know this is something uh, like a reference that not everybody's aware of, yeah. uh, not because necessarily, you know, they, they don't want to, it's just they're not exposed to it, right? Yeah, that's what uh, Julie commented in the uh, chat. Like the context of the exams are supposed to be real life, but not everyone has bottled wine or has taken a helicopter to find a missing person. So it's like real life, but real life to whom, right? So. So, so again, probably to the creators of these questions, then that's fine, you know, that's fine. But again, what is, what is uh, general knowledge is all in perspective, right? If I take this course in another country, maybe their references, their cultural reference completely different to mine, right? So there is that learning also. This is opportunities to learn that, yes, I understand your, your you know, it just, it shouldn't be the obstacle in the exam. You know what I mean? It should be more like, oh, do I know how to kind of figure out a mathematical problem versus, oh, I'm stuck on this or I'm stuck on that. Those should be kind of minimized to, a, to the best of our abilities, I guess. Uh, yes, Denise. I was going to say that I'm the math support in adult ed. So I work a lot with, well, one teacher in particular. So she'll teach her one way. And then those students who struggle come to me. And I often explain it in a completely different way. So that is using the different language. And sometimes it really helps. Oh, we can do it that way. So that's giving them the choices. And because we're adult ed, we often have a lot of students who language is, uh, English again is not their first language. So coming from the resource background, and again, because they're adults, it's been a long time. I start using elementary language, like we were talking about lesser than, greater than. And it was, so I said, remember when it was the alligator with the teeth? And then you draw it like, that's grade one, grade two. And then they're like, oh, we remember. So I often find that I have to use more elementary language for the adults to be able to, to get some of it back. And again, depending if it's their first language or not. And talking about the visualizations, for the first time for our exam coming up, the teacher I work with, we're working on memory aids with the students, but she and I are each gonna make one, same topics, but see how they differ and then let the students choose like which type of ideas visualization will help you. So that's how we've started to work that out for this term at least. No, very, very, very good. Uh, I, I use it all the time in my class. It's just uh, the the just to be careful that even in the explanation part, it's great all of these tricks. But when it comes, you have to associate terminology to it. So again, uh, me too. Trust me. I would. I had a group once that um, that did did not understand like like but like one of my groups was I had a majority of an immigrant population so when I start using like I was teaching geometry at the time and it was like prisms and uh, cubes and and to them I was like whoa what is this so I start using fridges and microwaves and and the ball and they were able to understand because they could connect to that but I couldn't stop with just saying oh you remember the fridge because on an exam they're not going to say the fridge right they're going to say the prism, like the rectangular prism. So these are terminology that they will be seen and will be tested. And obviously it's a language you're learning, right? It's a mathematical language that you're learning. So yes, during the explanation, during the connect, the connection of, of all of these terms, it, it, I personally, I never bring in terms because I want them to understand. But when it comes to kind of practicing, I have to bring back those terms because these are the terms that they're gonna be evaluated on. And it's actually part of the language because if they don't learn it, it's gonna be an issue throughout their learning. So so I, I, I so appreciate, I so second what you're saying in terms of going back 
uh, to basic and whatever method is required, we'll use to get them to, to understand. And once they feel confident and they understand that, we have to connect it to the, to, to the proper terminology. Yeah, Giovanna, you had a comment to add? Um, I was just going to say, I'm so glad that it was brought up that there's like the um, elements of youth sector that like, or, or very, very early that are brought in because oftentimes in our sector, it's like, oh, it's too baby, it's too baby, but it's like making those links. But of course, I understand that you would need to make those links with the language. I'm not a mathematician. This is not my subject area, but the, in, in our sector, in FG, sometimes the strategies that would be that we would use in youth sector are often like, oh yeah, but they're adults, but those same strategies, they're still valid. So I, I wanted to thank Denise for bringing that up. Yeah, thank you, Denise, seriously. Um, and now let's go back because I think uh, <laughs> we just kind of went on a tangent, but it's a so uh, worth, uh, worthwhile tangent. Um, so now if we just go back and say, well, what is a reading strategy for teachers uh, from a teacher's perspective versus a learner's perspective? Um, from a teacher's perspective, a reading strategy is a procedural knowledge that is thought to help a learner increase their reading skills because obviously this is an important skill to have. But from a learner's perspective, is a reading strategy is a way to bridge meaning between the language of words and the language of mathematics. In other words, it's just, I need, it's a tool for them to understand so they could be able to solve a problem, right? But personally, I find, and, and personally I find is the hardest part of teaching a strategy is to know when and how to introduce it. So it's almost like, it's like, if you introduce this as, oh, we're going to learn about a strategy, it's going to be like everything else. So we're going to put it on the shelf because it doesn't have purpose. It doesn't have meaning. But if it's planned in such, when I'm introducing a topic that requires a specific strategy, and I know my students struggle with it, take the opportunity that if the window of opportunity that he make a mistake and then or make a mistake or even introducing a topic with that new strategy is just to, to find the right moment. It's almost orchestrating the right moment to introduce that strategy that might allow the students openness to learn, to try it nicely. So, uh, so I, I personally, I, I learned with time that teaching a strategy has to be planned in the learning itself, in the teaching itself. So, uh, so it won't uh, it won't go about standalone strategy, right? Uh, that that right away it's modeled and implemented um, as an idea. So again, a reading strategy is if we have to think about it, it's read with intention, understanding words, spot keywords, obs uh, observe prefix and suffix, organize the idea of a text, check the information for comprehension gather information uh, when you're reading a text, determine the main idea while reading, self-correcting, you know, reread and verify information uh, found, read further and go back. It's like that workout in the, in, the, in the text and questioning the text. So it's having a full interaction with the complex task, having a full interaction with, with the context, okay? Now, um, when we're building reading strategies, so uh, these are little strategies or, or recommendation to use within, uh, within uh, when you're implementing reading strategies. So for example, when you're reading a situation, read a situation. So there's different reading method. One could be you read the problem to the class, like read aloud by the teacher or read aloud by the learner. I know some some students I had that they needed to read it out loud so they could hear themselves reading the problem to, to, to kind of initiate uh, processing. Uh, there's also, you read silently and then let's hear what you understand. So give them these options. And of course there's guided, uh, guided reading with some, um, with some support. Now, when we're talking also about mental, uh, mentally representing a situation, elicit uh, mental imagery. Again, by doing that, we could ask, uh, you could do it by rephrasing the given information in their own words. So let them read something and say, okay, tell me in your own word, what did you understand? What's the story talking about? What is this complex task is about? 
right? And see where the student is stuck, right? Uh, search for missing word, right? So um, fill in the blanks. In your opinion, what did he mean here? What did he do here? Uh, focus on understanding the vocabulary used. Mimic the situation, draw or choose a picture. Again, that's the visualization part, right? Um, and when we're talking about determine what question looks like, again, consider the meaning of a sentence, word, symbol, syntax, you know, use that to help you locate the question. Understand the instruction, reread the instruction, understand what to do. This is how you identify, well, the question, right? Locate the question in a, in a, in a, in a learning situation, use highlights you know, whatever, whatever is required. And personally, I think this is one of the most important steps to know what's the purpose of what we're doing. What's the question? Um, in terms of listing the information we have, again, consider the meaning of keywords, right? For example, as many as, and exactly like Denise said, when you go back to basic, we, we could have a list of all these words in, in, in language and have the symbol attached to it, right? So it's almost having their own mathematical dictionary. But this is gets built because every mathematical dictionary is individualized, right? You don't know what I know. So by having my own, what, what I don't know me may be different for Ricardo. Ricardo may have a bigger mathematical dictionary, but for me, it might be smaller. Or, uh, Giovanna might have even uh, two, three dictionaries. So she has to go through multiple language to get to where we are, right? So again, just to think, to individualize that. So it's almost like almost having a practice. Every time you read something, highlight a word or highlight something that you don't understand, right? Or make, put, it, put it in your own words or find your own uh, words that you're having trouble with. Uh, numerical data, of course, uh, polysmerous word. Word, those are the hardest. It's words that have multiple meanings, right? That it's put in a sentence that could have, like, you know, it, it means uh, inferences. In other words, like uh, it, it could mean this in this sentence, but take the same word, put it in another sentence. It could mean a different thing. So words with multiple meanings, these are words that should be discussed and should be, uh, should be brought up. Um, also identify all relevant information needed. So actually to practice, just give word problem and say, okay, tell me, what do I need to solve? Not to necessarily solve, but just to practice those skills, you know, extract, extract the information. Yes, Giovanna. Uh, Julie put a very pertinent comment. She likes to show them the rubric. So that the, you know, and so she shows the, like the, the points that are allotted like on the exam. So it's a great incentive to work on those things. Yeah. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Julie, for bringing this up. You'll see a bit later. I'm adding a little element to that too. Okay. I, I keep that in mind. Um, and of course, uh, when we're talking about also focus on implicit, superfluous or missing data, right? So again, the problem, you're extracting information. Obviously, you may be missing information. And that's where the thinking happens is like, do I have enough, even with the missing information to solve or not? Or if I'm missing information, to recognize, first of all, that I'm missing information, it's really important. Um, now, uh, when we're looking read to understand and solve a mathematical problem, we have three areas where we could be, uh, could be uh, encountering difficulties. If it's from the text itself, let's look at reformulate shortened sentences, specify the meaning of words, rereading, and building their own dictionary. So if this is the, 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 the issue is the text and they're able, so we could find solution for that. If it's from a data perspective, right? Represent the situation, uh, take into account essential data and ignoring others. So this discrimination, between what I need versus what I don't need, but from, from an information perspective to be able to solve. So that is another thing. So for example, I love Julie when she said, well, or um, I'm sorry, um, Jessica, what she said, well, if you're having trouble with the text, look at the graphs, look at the tables and try to see what you need. But the thing is, 
there's also a point here. You need to practice what these graphs, what kind of information this graph, like how to read a graph, what kind of information you could extract from a graph. So even those visual cues that you were given, you have to have, um, you have to know how to use them, right? So they're supposed to, um, so to have that training too. And the last point is if the problem is, if the obstacle is found in the instruction, is also to recognize the ability to respond or not to respond to the instruction. So that means that the instruction, like they don't like, again, uh, where's the issue, find their error. And from the error, go back. Is it too, too, uh, it's too long? Is it uh, not, if they're, they're not, uh, they don't have enough information, you know? Um, if unable to answer, find out why. So what, what's the issue? Why you can't find the question? Where do you think? Okay, guide me through your thinking. Let's reread it together, you know? And, and like, see, try to listen to what they're saying and through what they're telling you, try to find where they're, where it's falling apart. And if you're able to find where it's falling apart, then it's easy, the solution could be found. But if the problem is sometimes to find where is the issue, right? So what's the end result, the solution and the presentation would look like. So also like saying, okay, at the end, what am I supposed to be doing? Uh, what, what's like, again, with the flat tire, what's the problem? I, I need to get home and I so I need to fix my, my tire, right? So to be able to say, well, the problem of this, you know, situation is this, this, this. Um, also, um, read it to understand how to solve a math problem, of course, analyzing the syntax of the question. Sometimes there's a lot of hints in the question itself, right? Now, Every, anybody, uh, before we go uh, on a break, does anybody uh, have any comment, any question? Everybody's up for a break. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, I just want to say that the idea to, sh to show them a picture of a representative situation, like and show them two or three pictures to three different um, situations and uh, for them to choose the one on the phone, I, I think it's an amazing idea. I never good to me, and uh, that will be a pretty good beginning before helping to, you know, develop the, the imagination to, to read uh, a problem for a, a common one. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Very, very good. I, and I, I just want to add one more thing before I let you go on break is um, to Julie's comment when she was talking about, let's show the rubric. I would like to add to that. Let's also show the formula sheet and use the formula sheet from day one. The formula sheet in an exam is a tool to support, like to help out the student, you know, to know what they, they have access to. So if it's their first time is to see it on the exam, it doesn't become a tool. It becomes a problem because if, especially if they're shown these formulas or whatever it is differently in class, there is also that hinder, hindrance. So this is something we will talk further when we come back from break. Um, so here it's, it's if, we can if we go further, this is other things that, um, that um, just to go back in, in, in the thought, like, you know, like uh, Michelle, what you brought up, like uh, about your student saying that he, when he, he did one complex task exceptionally well and the other two, he wasn't able to link to it. Well, you know, one of the things you can do if we take that example to expand uh, their palette of knowledge, let's say to expand their general knowledge is to recognize that math is not only in the classroom, that math happens outside the classroom. And to do that, unfortunately, sometimes we have to do mechanically link these thoughts, you know, and, and by actually de demoing uh, that, look, when you're reading a weather report, you are actually doing math because the weather report has lots of percentages, has a lot of statistics, right? It's all based on statistics like you're learning in class. Reading reports with mathematical data, like if, if they're into investment and, um, and stock markets, right? Um, reading simply labels, just labels on, on food products, right? Uh, also recipes, you know, like 
I, I used to, I, I actually, in one of my uh, CCB classes, when I was teaching fraction and proportions and all of that stuff, I would say, okay, today, I, when I'm talking about the experiential, uh, experiential teaching math, I actually did, um, I brought a recipe to school and today the class, the math class was happens to be in the, in the, in the cafeteria and we're going to cook together a cake. Except what I did intentionally is I gave different recipes to everybody with different proportions. Or, uh, and I asked them, uh, okay, um, oh, uh, no, what I did, actually, sorry, it's not true. I gave everybody the same recipe and I say, okay, uh, let's all do this recipe. This is my cake, taste it, look how good it is. That's in the time prior to COVID, right? So <laughs> taste it, <laughs> look at it. And now it's your turn. This is your recipe, figure it out. And it was super interesting to see how they were not able to kind of measure, you know, and able to transfer like, okay, half a cup means, okay, well, half a cup was a straight thing, but to some of them, how, when we bake the cakes, when I put them in teams and we actually bake the cakes, how the cakes tasted completely different. And this was while we're making the cake, I would say, well, okay, well, I would have this mathematical conversation with them. Well, what if, if this recipe is made for, let's say, I don't know, for, five people, what would it be if it was 10 people? What would we do? Oh, well, we'll double this. So, okay, what does that mean? Instead of a half a cup, it becomes what? Oh, a full cup because half and half makes two, like two of the same cup. So I could literally show it like how two half cups looks like as a one cup. So they could connect visually, right? Um, so I, I used to play around with like hands-on activity to make that connection you know, in terms of, of contextual connection. Um, in terms of another project I've done is like also talking about, um, I say, okay, let's measure the school and make a diorama, like in a smaller thing. So they physically, I say, okay, well, if the, if the wall measures eight feet or whatever it is, like X amount of meters, how would that fit on my piece of paper? They're like, they can't. Okay, so what would I have to do? So they learn proportions that way, but again, you have to give them different way. You have to, you know, like you have to link it sometimes almost mechanically so they could see, oh, I see. Okay. Like money exchanges, like make a, like uh, somebody might take um, the role of the cashier in a classroom uh, or actually just by getting to know what they do or what they're interested in, you could bring in these contexts to link some stuff too. Okay. Um, also allow a time uh, with independent reading, you know, like this is, of course, this is to expand these limits is when you're, you're having an interaction with a class, you could do that, but in uh, also allow time for independent reading. So you give them a uh, text promoting reflection, logic, reasoning with not necessarily with numbers and calculation. Actually, there is this new method that's coming up. Um, well, I was reading about it is actually having these mathematical conversation with students with no numbers just literally have the mathematical problem, extract the number completely and have this conversation. And that is super interesting because the numbers don't become the focus. It becomes more like, okay, okay, what do you mean? Well, if he need a certain amount of this to do that, what would you do? So you're focusing more about the solving and the processing of the problem and forget about the numbers because I know some people, like some of your, for our students is like they get stuck with the number. I, I need to know the right answer. I need to know the right answer. And sometimes that takes away from the process. So by removing that, you can have these conversations. You know, and also you're, you're actually uh, improving their communication skills, right? Um, finding information using lexicon, you know, like just give them, they have their phones, they have stuff, use it, use it to the benefit of the class, right? And the last, uh, last, the last uh, idea could be uh, the learner choice. Somebody is interested, um, like I, I know one student once in my class uh, was having a really hard time understanding how his hydro bill works, you know, and he'll come back, I don't understand. Or his paycheck, like, why are they taking out money here? Where is, what does pension mean? 
all of these things. So you could bring an invitation, like say, okay, your real life stories, like where are you struggling with at home or having difficult, you wanna bring in an example you could share with the class. Like, you know, I don't know uh, uh, the famous credit cards, uh, why some credit cards are better than others, okay? Uh, like these kind, extend the classroom outside, you know, outside. Um, Listen, there's a comment in the chat. Uh, Denise made a comment. I don't want to, gonna, so it's once you hit secondary school and adult ed, the curriculum is so heavy and full that there isn't time uh, for the fun experimental activities. I just want to speak to that because that's the thing that keeps reoccurring. It's like, there's no time for fun. There's no, okay, so the, your class should always be fun, period. But it's it's that choice, that teacher choice that sometimes not sacrificing, but just redirecting how we approach things, those things go further. Because exactly, we have such a limited amount of time. And how do we have that transfer? How do we get that click moment? Sometimes it is in making those choices of like, this is how I'm going to approach this, um, this subject, this topic, this, this, this learning today. So I wanted to speak to that. And Julie, oh, it's a minute. Uh, so Julie also says, I like to make students write a word uh, ne next to each numerical answer. So that way they always have the, the they relate the calculation to the concept and uh, it's more easily used the numbers in their solution as needed. So yeah, so she, she makes them write the word to the concept. And Jessica also says, oh, the link to the series on the workshop on curiosity. So this is the uh, workshop that withholds information. Uh, so to withhold information with existing heavy questions, uh, you have to do so becomes interesting. So she puts a link to the workshop in the chat if you're interested. So I'm mm -hmm. sorry, Amy, I spoke too much. Uh, no, 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 not at all, not at all. They're all they're uh, they're all uh, valid. Uh, well, they're, they're very good comments. And and just to talk to Denise's uh, point, I totally totally understand, and you're absolutely correct. Not correct, but it is a reality that in adult ed we are limited in time and term because the program is is you know topic heavy if you want, and on top of it the gaps in learning, and on top of it the all kind of luggages these students walk into our classroom with. Um, and I, I, I totally agree with Giovanna. It's a choice the teacher make. However, I, I also would like to add to that. It's also perspective. Students don't like math for a reason. They failed. They've practiced that recipe so well that they master it. And they walk into a classroom to a similar pattern teacher in the front, a book to follow, an exercise to do. Sometimes the element of shock of doing something different, it will give us the opportunity, a window, a small opportunity to shake that, that, that insecurity or that beliefs for math. So sometimes like, like, um, like I'll give you an example, like the first day, like once I had a class, uh, you know, it's at the beginning of the semester, I was a party at the time. And I, and I know students usually they stand up in line outside, you know, until you open the door. And one day I just brought my backpack and I put in my backpack and these are like sec one, sec two uh, students. I was actually a sec, sec two student class. And I stood there with the students in the, in the line. And then uh, my neighbor was John, Jonathan Heller. He comes and he was like, uh, he just opens the door because we have a tendency like the clock is going to ring. Everybody opens the door of the classroom and everybody comes in and we're all sitting. And I sat down with the students in the class because they don't know me. They're new, right? So I sat down there and they, I was listening to them talk. And I said, oh my God, where's the teacher? And I was like the one saying, oh, where's the teacher? She's so behind, like she's late. She wants us to be on time. I was complaining with the students about me, right? And they're all talking. And then the bell ring and everyone's like, oh, class is canceled. The teacher is not here. So I was like, oh my God, what a good idea. Let's forget about math. And I got up in the front and everybody's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, hi, my name. And, and I got them by surprise. And they were all like devastated. I was like, oh my God, the student, the teacher is crazy, you know? But I shook that beginning of class. And then I told them, I'm nervous like you guys, your first day, my first day, and it's math. I don't like math. You don't like math, but we're going to love it together. And and just kind of have that 
element of surprise, that element, like the first day we didn't do math, we did like built team building and stuff. So I took them by surprise that it's not a typical math class that here you will succeed, you'll try something new. To some of them, I tell you, they were like so scared. They wanted to run by the window, but it also was a fresh, you know, it was, it was a new start, you know? So it's just like sometimes trying the same recipe over what I'm trying to get at, sometimes it's expected to sit down, to solve, not to do well, not to know things because it was so, so it was done so many times in the past that it's almost like expected. So throwing in something to take them off, to, to kind of make them, oh, what's happening? This is different. I haven't seen that, you know? Like, yeah, like for example, exactly. I love Julie what you just added there in an individualized setting. So instead of coming in the first day and just say, this is a book, you have to do this and this, throw in a video, throw in something that has nothing to do with that. Tell them, talk to them, say, well, what's your interest? Like stuff like that, even like feeling uh, like, I don't know, just take a moment to have that, kind of unbalancing what their expectation it will take you far um that being said uh now i'm gonna bring in the inclusivity in math it's a different angle uh, that we're, we're gonna be tackling i love this uh this this image was circulating often uh, around and i thought it was so fitting for here is because it's like it's talking about exam but I'll, I'll turn it into complex tasks imagine you have different students in your class which we have uh, different kind of students in our class right diverse classrooms and we're expecting everybody to do the same thing the same way so if we ask our uh, elephant friend here well uh, can you climb a tree go ahead we're not taking in consideration who he is and what he can do you know and just to let you know, I had a conversation with a, one of my colleagues and I said, you know what, I'm clever enough to be able to pass this exam, even though I'm an elephant, but regardless with the right strategy, right? But we're not gonna go there. That's just the rebel mind. Um, so when we're looking about inclusion in mathematics, we're tackling actually um, four, four corners, if you want, four categories, the content, the framework uh, or the structure, the process and the production. Oops, sorry. This is a geniality that I will be, uh, um, we will be giving it to you. Uh, we'll give you the link and you'll have access to it. Uh, so you could use it to, uh, to your liking. By the way, this portion here is built, uh, is credited to Karine Jacques. So I'm just uh, doing la porte parole, like we say, I'm, uh, you know. So in terms of content, in terms of content, we're looking at the, information inside of the complex tasks and in the books. So uh, so how can we do to, to help not only our, our, the, our students with challenges, but everyone in the classroom is actually uh, looking at ways that we could present the material to them in a, in a, in a structure, to help them get it structured and organized in their mind. So uh, when we're looking at uh, accessibility in terms of font, uh, we're looking for fonts without uh, sans serif, which means if you take a look at the um, at the letter, the way it's represented, it, it's a very clear, clean cut letter. It's not fancy with twirls and whistles at the end of it. So this is somebody somebody who has learning disability in terms of like let's say ADHD or uh, dyslexia may be taken by the detail and and have a harder time to read. And also research said uh, for dyslexia font, uh, it, it's, it's not necessary to download dyslexia font. These kind of fonts will do the same job. So you don't need to get a special font for dyslexic students. Those kind of fonts will do the job, okay? So like you have Arial, Century Gothic, Comics on MS, there's the Homa also, and there's other ones. Just make sure whatever font you choose that the letter is very clean cut. Um, ideally, uh, increasing the font size is very useful. I know 14 seems like really large, but 12 to 14 it really helps the students who have reduced visions or, or students who have, um, it's, just, it's just like, I'm not gonna say bigger in this case is, is better for the reader, but it just gives, it gives more air in the wordings. Um, numbering tasks. 
please use number uh, numbers in terms of um, uh, numbering the tasks, numbering the pages, numbering the topics, numbering everything, because it's easy. It's it's almost providing the students with a structure and an organization for the students who have difficulty organizing their stuff. So when you're referring to something, they're able to find it. Okay, uh, printing on only one side is really useful. I know it's not environmentally friendly, but it's actually learning friendly because <laughs> learning friendly, the back of the students flip and flop and trying to read this page. And I know it's behind the other day in the transcription, in the transfer of numbers from one page to the other. Some of the students may miss a, a comma, may miss a dot, may miss a number, actually inverse a number. So having everything on the page where they could constantly reference to is ideal. So usually in complex tasks, what we would like, ideally having that like magazine look where you have on one side is the full complex task and on the other side is uh, the, the, the question. So you have the question and all the information is within the view of the students, um, uh, which would be really useful for the student. Also leaving a, a spacing between the lines, having a 1.5 uh, interline spacing. And that is mainly for highlighting, writing comments. If it's an, uh, a, a student with the, um, from a different country may have a translation written there. So it has a space to work with the text. So when he's reading or she's reading, uh, they're able to, 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 to have a better flow. And also, uh, uh, it also looks cleaner uh, more organized, so it almost like reflects it in, in the student's mind. Leaving rooms between tasks is super important. Just think about the student that requires that extra piece of paper, that his information is dispersed on multiple documents, and at the end of the day, they lose it, they don't know what it is. Again, having enough space on one after every task will allow the student to put all their information in one place. So you're helping the student to get organized. And just to go on a more technical point is when we're talking about the oral written and the mathematic, we're talking about different codes in the brain. And the transfer between these codes is not, let's say a smooth transfer. It is actually, it is, um, uh, it's, it is a transfer, but it, it's a complex transfer. So imagine when you're talking, writing, and thinking about math all at once, it's already a load on the brain. Everything's fired up. Add to that a different language. Add to that a learning issue. Then it becomes an overload on the brain. So to elevate that overload, let's present the material in such a way that could kind of help you know, receive the information, right? We want a pretty, pretty document in a way. So you wanna, you know, you wanna engage with it and, and it helps the transfer also. So in terms of also content, using verbs, you know, before and in, in the first part of this, this workshop, when we're talking about, you know, uh, what uh, Vanessa said, when you have a certain amount of information and then the question follows on the instruction, sometimes it's just a bit confusing, overwhelming for the student. It's really nice when you're providing content that you actually use action verbs. And I included, you'll see, I included action verbs here with, uh, with the Bloom taxonomy. So that will help you as a teacher to know what you're aiming for versus versus the students. So when I say remember, recall, you know, apply, solve, that also gives me a hint, what am I aiming for, right? Um, favoring sentences, like short sentences with subject verb object, of course, is very concise, that helps. Uh, favoring repetition instead of synonym or anaphoras, meaning words with that has uh, lots of inferences, you know, that have multiple meaning that also will help with the content. And of course, most of our complex tasks or, or content has imagery. Imagery is super important. One of the strategies that is taught in languages or even in, in reading uh, as a reading strategy is if you're having trouble understanding the context in terms of the wording, look for other cues, right? So in this case, you look for an image to support the understanding, to, 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 to support the comprehension of the problem. So if I put just a box with some information, 
that doesn't necessarily under, like support the understanding that just gives me the shape. But if you take a look at the second imagery, the one on the right, it will give me like a bit of a more of an insight of what is the problems asking me. So for somebody who has difficulty understanding context, may rely on imagery, on images to support. So your selection of image, you know, a visual representation should be with the intention to support the content, the comprehension of the problem. Um, now in terms of the process is, is, we're looking at the process, avoid going back and forth. We could all, to avoid that, we could detach the appendix, you know, from the exam. So if you're in, a, in a, an evaluation situation, detach the appendix and you could have it close by when you need it, right? So the formula sheets, whatever it is. Always, always bring back the student to remember what is the original objectives? What's the question of this? What am I doing? Remember, complex tasks have a lot of subtasks, but to always keep that question in mind. So maybe one way to have always the question place at the top. If you're practicing in class, maybe the first few complex tasks should have the question always there, like a little area where what is the question of the problem? So constantly the students will look up and see it, right? Um, other thing is, uh, I know in my, 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 in my classes, I always, when I have students working on stuff like that, I always go back, what is the question? Whenever anyone asking me for support, the first thing I used to say, what is the question? What do we need to do? What is this for? What is this useful for? So it's always keep on bringing them back. You're not just doing things mechanically. You're doing this because there's a purpose to it. Using manipulative tools and videos. Manipul uh, manipulative, remember, some of us, uh, the, because we have a, a classroom full of diverse learners, um, manipulative for kinesthetic learners are so, so important. Not only for students with, uh, well, with difficulty, we're talking about just kinesthetic learners. I love touching, feeling like I need in my head, like, you know, I I'm just this kind of learner, right? Um, somebody else may just like sit there and just stare at the teacher and just have everything auditory. Some other people might just needs, you know, needs to, to draw and, and visualize having more that visual uh, component. Again, it's never one sense that we're not only one thing, we're many things. But remember, all our mental uh, elementary training school years are all based on visual. Moving into high school, we're starting to let go of that visual moving into the auditory. So where is the kinesthetic learner? If they had a bit of luck, they had teachers who let them manipulate a lot in elementary schools, but that's usually in the early years and, and that's it. So they're already at a disadvantage. So bringing back manipulative as normalized strategy in a classroom, it's, it's a really good thing for our learners, especially in the, uh, age, uh, in the age network. One of, uh, um, one of um, uh, research support, one of the best way of learning in a classroom is actually peer teaching. It's actually scientifically proven. It's been one of the highest if most efficient uh, way of learning, right? So I know in a classroom, teachers could create like teamworks, but in an individualized setting, you could also combine students. Like let's say somebody in sec four and somebody in sec three, have them sit together on the same table, each one doing their thing, but maybe once in a while, create that connection saying, well, to the sec four person teaching to the, like just explain what do I do here and have that secondary four student explain it to the secondary three student just creating like it's just how you set up your classroom sometimes might help that that, that math discussion or that math simulation um also read it to the learner reading i remember when i had um when i was administering my physics exams to my students uh to kind of eliminate uh, like like not segregation, but like to identify some student to have a reader to them. I used to read the exam for everybody in the class. And I know some of them are like, like, look at me, I don't need you to read it. I say, look, the timer did not start. Everybody's listening. So I used to read it out loud to everybody and then let them start, right? So uh, reading it, it doesn't harm. It might just help, right? And other things is like, I know some, re, uh, some of our learners have difficulty kind of bringing in the, the communication aspect, the writing aspect, and that could be an obstacle in communicating their, uh, 
their uh, their their thoughts. So text to speech is a beautiful way of of helping them uh, communicate. Again, here uh, we're talking about manipulative and peer uh, peer learning. Now, in terms of uh, production, giving them choices. You know, uh, um, just give me one moment, uh, Denise. As we just finished this. Um, be very clear on your expectation, right? Allocating time for constructive feedback, being by voice message or using like a little video or using cue cards. It's so important for the student. And why am I, uh, and, and this is actually based on research because the student could go back and actually re-listen to your feedback. And it's not the type of feedback that you say, oh, you did a great job, which is nice to hear, but that's not what they're looking for. They're, they're looking for feedback that they're, how they could improve, how can they make this better? So having it uh, in, a, in, a, in a verbal, in a, in a digital way that, recorded with they could go back and listen to it it's a very very useful way of, of giving constructive feedback also um again giving the answer key from day one so just give them the answer because again if we take a look at the uh, cri uh, evaluation criterias in terms of percentage and we're all mathematicians here is out of the hundred percent of uh, of, uh, of a complex task, five percent is allocated to the answer, and ninety five percent is allocated to the process. So it's worthwhile, uh, even if the answer is wrong, it's worthwhile to to work on the pro uh, to teach the students the process. So we we should give more exercises with no numbers and make them focus on how to go about solving something versus on getting this the, the right answer. Um, another way of also helping in the production, think fair share, obviously think by yourself, have a sounding board with a colleague, and then share it with the rest of the class, right? Um, one more thing is planning evaluation time with students. It's not necessarily giving the students to tell you when they should take the evaluation, that's not up to them. It's more having, uh, getting to know the student when they're at their best. Are they better in the morning? Are they better in the evening? Are they better the, uh, earlier in the week, end of the week? So it, it will just, you're trying to maximize success for your student. Do they need to start up taking an exam? Do they need to sit down while they're taking an exam? These are all little details that to you may means nothing, but to the student, it may make a huge world of difference. And another thing is if you have a student who's sitting there and like doesn't seem to do anything, have those conversations where you are his hands, you know? So let them talk and you take note for the student and show him uh, or show them who, who, whoever is the student is their reasoning. Like you become their mind on that piece of paper and go through, is this what you meant? Is it? So you're modeling what he's thinking or she's thinking on a piece of paper. So you're becoming the extension of their, their mind. Yes, Denise. I just wanted to ask about the, the, the text to speech. So for us, we do exam accommodation, which is a government exam. And many of our students in their language arts classes have text to speech. But when it comes to math right now, um, for the exam, we bring in a reader. But I'm just wondering if anyone else has any, like, none of our exams are computerized from the government, so we can't do that. So I was just wondering exam-wise, like, has anyone done text to speech for that? Because we can't. Um, well, you see, in, in math, legally speaking, uh, again, IEPs and stuff, reader is a must if this is part of it. Uh, read to, uh, text to speech in mathematics, I don't know of anyone who is using it. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I know some. Well, Technically, we're working on that right now with the with the responsable program because it actually was brought up on uh, like inclusivity in terms of like what we, what can we do to to help the uh, the uh, like support the student for that. There's I, personally, I don't know in my centers, both centers I worked in was not something we did. Just the, but there's no like. I don't know if there's any legal uh, implication that, that says you're allowed to do this or not do this. I don't think so. I don't know. Correct me, Vanessa, if I'm wrong or right on this. 
Yeah, I know they're working on which accommodations can be brought on, but it's like it's at the same time as of trying to experiment at the yacht sector, the the numeric evaluation. So if they are, you know, allowed all of these tools at the youth sector, then we're going to be able to ask them for the adult general education. I know Martin Francaire has been like called each year to give feedback about these experimental youth sector uh, evaluations, but it's always like experimental and but he's giving them feedback and we're hoping that once it's going to be totally implemented in the youth sector, then we're going to be able to have a leverage uh, and ask for the same in the adult general education sector. And since they're, they're calling Martin to actually comment the youth sector, you know, experimental evaluation, I think it's a, it's a, there's already a door open there, but until it's past the experimental stage and it's been a few years, uh, I think we're still like trapped in this uh, no man's land, but I'm, I'm, the ministry side of it is open. They're experimenting stuff with the youth sector. So I think once this is done, we're going to have a good uh, open door to actually do the same. Yeah, yeah. And just to just to reemphasize what Vanessa said, at this moment there is actually testing in digital exams too. So exam given online. So it's still in the in the uh, like like Vanessa said, it's been now they're 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 opening the door to test it in the youth sector. So hopefully, when that goes well and they iron all the mix and max, let's say, uh, that'll come over, that'll spill over to adult ed. So, so that brings this section to to term. So now I could uh, pass the mic for the my my linguistic expert, <laughs> Vanessa, to to. Uh, to take this. Thank you, Micheline, you're very nice. I'm gonna let you go on with the PowerPoint. So if we take a look at the linguistic perspective right now, so we're gonna kind of take a step back. We just talk a lot about math, but I think that one element to like, I've worked with math teachers before and not all of them, maybe the people here are more interested or you know keen on reading strategies, but it's interesting to go back to the linguistic theory out of it. So we're gonna kind of take a, a little step back, like Micheline was really, very hands on and ideas to do in the classroom. So we're just gonna take a step back and look at the theory a little bit more and be sure that we are all on the same page in order to be able to do the second workshop is gonna be really hands on. So to solve a complex task in math, you have to read the complex task and derive meaning from it. That's the first step. Have a correct global semantic representation of the problem, of course. Use your reading strategies properly. That's very important. And then validate the solution in context, meaning also regarding text. So it's not just having adequate mathematical concepts and tools. There's a huge part. We're all agreeing on this. That's reading. So there's really, uh, and I think, it is okay, it's through all of the curriculum. It's not just in maths, it's true in science, in social science, in languages. So we are using language to communicate and so we really have to have some reading skills. When we look at the complex task, we really have two parts. When we were reading like these complex tasks in maths, we see that there's a first part normally it's, it's starting with that, that provides information about the situation to solve. And there's a second part where we have a direction for action, very often a question to be, uh, to be clear. And this is something we can teach explicitly to students. What am I saying that? Because if we, some students are very, well, they're, they're very weak reader. So if we just explain to them the structure of a complex task, from a text point of view, it might help them say, look, at the beginning, we generally have information and very often at the end, and even better when it's in bold or it's very highlighted, you have the questions or you have an implicit action asked from you. So this is something we can teach them. And then afterwards, when they get better, we can expand that range, you know, but we can start with a very specific complex task that do um, follow this model. So the scenario here, I'm explaining it a bit more, is uh, in two parts. So you have, and that's a hard one, and we're going to 
we're going to talk in the second workshop about this. There's a variety of texts also that are used in the informative section. It might be a narrative text. So sometimes you have a story. Someone's going to the store, he's buying grocery, and then, oh, he meets a friend. And then the friend says, oh, I only have 20 bucks. Can you buy me this? And then you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, it's a, it's a narrative text. It's not informative. So I have to make meaning of this story and actually pick up the important information in this narrative text. And this happens a lot in the exams in the higher grades, like sec four and five, we had a lot of those stories, stories. And then we have, we have actually characters in the story. So it, it's a lot to handle in a math problem for a student. So it's important to know that there's different types of texts. And there's also informative and descriptive. Uh, these texts are also represented in various ways. So it might be sentences, like I just said, but it, it can also be diagrams, figures, images, drawings. And we, I mean, we said that many times, but if it's only sentences, we really suggest that they have a change of representation. They try to draw it. They try to make charts with it and just extract the important mathematical information. So if there's only one representation, it's only text, even strong reader, they should actually take a step of representing the situation and pulling out the important information. If we are looking at the second part in blue on my graph, it's actually well, thank you for Giovanna, because I, you know, I was a French teacher, so I was really looking for the right word in English, and Giovanna and Michelin came back, I was talking, I was saying injunctive text that doesn't really exist, so I'm sorry about that, so it's more like an imperative, an imperative sentence or a question, so if you have an imperative sentence, you're telling the students what to do, like, find this, or analyze this. So you're going to have an order given to the students that should put him into action. Or you can ask a question. So that can be implicit or explicit. And when it's implicit, it's very hard for the students to actually know what to do. Sometimes analyze this and give the better scenario. And it's like, oh my God, analyze this, give the better scenario. What's the better scenario? Is it the, the cheapest? Is this the easiest? And then they start asking themselves questions and sometimes they get stuck there, just there. You know, there's too much implicit information. The question is too vague. And then they, they're, they're already discouraged. So this is something that we really have to take steps and build on. We start with very easy complex tasks with easy vocabulary, less implicit, and then slowly, you know, we make it harder and Yes, there's some difficulties, obstacles, but we cannot give them a full on super hard, you know, complex task. So this is something to take into account when we work with the students and something also that you can teach. You can not, you can simplify this, but you could totally teach this to the students and say, this is how complex tasks are built. And can you build me one? That would be a super, like a very great exercise to actually reverse this. You've seen this task. Can you build me one for another students of the classroom? So you're going to bring in information. You're going to ask a very clear question and you're going to make it explicit. This this is the information part, this is the question part or the order part. So this could be taught and I think it's very important to take the time to do it because it's going to be used in sec 3, sec 4, sec 5, like in maths all over again. If we even dig more into that question part, because something we have to think of is I would like my students to read the scenario or the complex task more than once. Because very often the question or the other is at the end. So they only know what they're looking for after they read it once. If, if, they, if they're like weak reader, they're not gonna look for the questions. That might be something we teach them. But if it's very weak reader, he's gonna read the whole thing and say like, oh, this is what I'm looking for. And now I have to read it again and try to find the, you know, the relevant information now that I know the question and what I'm going to do with this. So there's like a reread process. And to start with, I think it's okay. Like a weak reader, I would let him read it once, identify the question, highlight it. That's actually a good strategy. Try to rephrase it, make sure he understands what needs to be done if it's implicit. And then read again 
and select the important information in the sentences. So that's something that can be taught, like a simple process of rereading twice, at least, because they're missing information if not. Strong reader, they might go straight to the question, if even like if, especially if it's like highlighted in bold or whatever, and then say, oh, that's my, uh, it's actually a reading intention. What's my goal while reading? I'm trying to solve this, and this is what I'm gonna need to do, so I need to go and read this. A strong reader might go straight to the question, okay, I'm gonna need to pay attention to this and that, read the informative part that was before, and then straight away, find whatever he needs to. But those are strong readers and most of our students in adult general education are not strong readers. I'm not gonna, <laughs> they're often there because they were not strong readers. And we know that reading skills are very connected to success in actually school, in schooling. So like education success rates are very highly linked to numeracy and literacy levels. So we have to, take this into account in all, all the classroom. And I'm very glad, actually, I was not expecting these answers at the beginning when everyone said it's all of us, you know, all of us, we need to work on this, all of us, math teachers, social science teachers, uh, uh, you know, so, um, even uh, resource teachers. So I was like, oh, I was really pleased with these answers at the beginning. I'm like, everybody's feeling concerned, you know, because we know it's linked to success. So yeah, so if we look at the really the procedural part of the statement or the instruction, we said it can be an order. An order is very often explicit and it uses imperative action verbs. These can be taught. I mean, we can teach the, the students exactly this. It can be an order. An order is often explicit. You're going to find it very directly. And these are the construction that are normally used, like calculate the time required to complete a project, draw a regression line, describe the property, uh, the proper the properties of the figure. Maybe it should be a uh, plural, but yes. And if it's a question, that's sometimes harder than order because they have to know what they're supposed to do. So there's a question and sometimes it makes the task implicit. They're looking for something, but they don't have the steps given to them. They don't know the subtask. They don't know what they should do first, second. Order is very often easier. They can have many orders, like you have to do this, 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 and that. So they already have like the process, but when you have the question, you don't necessarily know where to start. What are the steps you're going to have to be, you know, to take? So, and it's uh, constructed differently. Very often, you have an infinitive action verb that is used, like "Can the deadline be met?" What volume will require the least material for its construction, and so on. So, you see, just this. I would take a whole class and explain this to students. So, I make links between linguistic aspect of the complex task and the math out of it. And then you can even have them build some, like I said earlier. So this is something that we really need to take the time to teach our students. I think it's, it would actually, and actually if someone is willing and we're gonna talk about this later, but to experiment, experiment this in the classroom, we would be really, really happy to learn about how it's going on and what we can do to actually support you. So that's uh, another thing that we need to take into consideration while thinking about you know reading strategies and i'm even taking a like more step like a further step back so that's what we're doing with me we're working we're walking backwards with me today so there's a model for actually comprehension in reading and there's three dimensions the first one is the reader so what's the reader's goal his motivation his skills so all of this is one of the dimension. The second one is the text itself. So the, the person that wrote the text, what was his or her intention? What's the text structure? So I talked before about like type of text, but there's also how the ideas are organized. Are there like separated to help the students or the students have has like a big bunch of text like in the example for Michelin like pages and pages of text that he has to organize and main ideas and secondary ideas so that's hard um, and also the content so we talk a lot about vocabulary and that's like the starting point I think it's very important but there's like other elements and the context and that one is very often you know, we don't really look at the context, but psychological, is it interesting for the students? 
like maybe the subject is like we talked about like living in the city or living elsewhere and you're thinking about septic tanks but i'm going to be honest if i'm not buying a house soon that needs a septic tank i'm not going to be super interested in this situation even if i live you know in not in a city setting i'm going to say wow we're talking about you know poo <laughs> so, and thinking about like what's the the range of this tool and i'm like okay this is like very further uh, it's very far from my personal interest let's say maybe someone else is going to be interested but i'm not sure all of the classroom is going to be interested in this you know complex task the social uh, aspect of it and michelin said that like intervention of, of peers and teachers if they can discuss if they can question themselves is if they, it's going to help them out and finally, physical. And when Mission was talking about the inclusion, you know, uh, inclusivity, I'm not sure of the word, right? Inclusivity, yeah, of all the students, thank you. Uh, so this is, this is touching this, the context, the font chosen, the clarity of the text, all of these, it's kind of external to text because the content is not affected about how it's presented, but how it's presented might really affect the comprehension of students. So this is something that really needs to be addressed even for students that do not have any special needs or any disabilities. Like all of the students might like comprehend the text better if this is taken into account. So that was a step back that we were gonna take together. Then, it's still the same part as before, like if we want to understand a question, but I just highlighted some of the, uh, you can move on the next slide, Michelin, sorry. Thank you, Michelin. So these are just some of the obstacles, but I'm very happy because I'm going to go like, I want, I want Giovanna to have some time to be hands on, but I just want to say we talked about most of these linguistic obstacles before, like vocabulary, like unusual words or terms that the student doesn't know. So if you start, you might really start with something you're sure he's gonna know about. And it's vocabulary that the student has. The syntactic or the complex grammatical structures, I said that before, like knowing that was like everywhere in the math exams. And it's super complex sentence to say, knowing that thing, you have to do this, instead of just having a sentence that says, this is the information. And then you have a question and you have something to do. And then it's in two sentences instead of in one sentence. That makes a big difference. But, and that's really just about the text. But if you look at the reader's knowledge right now, then the nature of the information is super important. Is there any inference to be made? Like if you have inferences to actually make to understand the text, you lost a huge part of your readers because they're just looking for the right information in the text. They're not able to look for the implicit if they're not asked or guided. Like you lost a huge part of your students. So this has to be addressed too. The structure of the text also might be unknown if they're not used to, let's say, narrative text in maths. Maybe they know narrative text in French, but they don't know narrative in maths. Just that might throw them off. So it's something that needs to be questioned and they just need to be modeled, you know, in the classroom. So they need, uh, Michelin said exposure. I think that's the right word. They need to be exposed gradually to these, you know, types of obstacles, but not all of them together, <laughs> especially not at the first complex task. And the overall semantic, like representation of a problem, we talked a lot about that, but I think it's very important to look at this. So one of the tools that we actually looked at was this amazing uh, book. It exists in French and in English. If ever you teach in both languages and you're really interested in these, for the French one, it's actually, it does reading strategies for mathematics, science, and social sciences. So it's one book for the three domain, if you want the three subject areas. Uh, in maths, they're all separated because this is the original version. So in maths, they were created for maths and then science and then uh, social science. Yeah. Michelin has them all. <laughs> she couldn't resist once I told her. She, she bought them all. And there's also, yeah, there's also like um, 
more digital resources uh, with the earlier ver the, the the earlier no the earlier version has a CD I think and mine who's in French has like it's online there's like some resources yeah to be used with the students so to actually really work with these strategies. Uh, I'm not gonna go over all of these strategies. That would be the next workshop, but I just wanna say that there's over 10 very good reading strategies and they are applied in maths with example of what you can do in your math class. So this is not just, oh, go look, I'm sorry, go look at this um, very good book and it's just about reading strategies. It's Oh yeah, okay. And uh, it's really like for mathematics. So I really love this one. We're just gonna look at two of them, two strategies, and then we're gonna go on. So let's say we're just gonna take a very simple case study because I'm not a math teacher. <laughs> so I took something very simple to be sure to be able to, you know, not lose you or lose myself more or more than lose you. So let's say my students doesn't know the word rectilinear. I'm not even sure I can say it correctly, but this word, the students can't say, doesn't know what it means. So the book actually suggests many strategies. One of it would be a root learning map. So I have the, um, the root learning map. So rect, which is a prefix in that word, means in a straight line. And I could ask the students which word like in your own vocabulary do you know and we put these three maybe he doesn't know that but there's good chances that he knows what's a rectangle what's a correct answer and what's the direction you see these are very familiar words for most of our students so he can recognize that oh this part of the word i've seen it before and in which words these words that are in my own vocabulary and then we can go and explain that rec means in the straight line and also a dictionary so that, that's one way to put it. And when he's going to be in contact again with that word rectilinear, he's going to be able to have a prior knowledge and have links with other words that he knows in his own vocabulary. So it has more chances to actually stick in his memory and bring him back to that. And in the book, they, uh, they talk about some class that it was in the youth sec sector, but still, um, it, 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 I think it's relevant to adult general education, they would put them, uh, they would make them on like boards and just put them up in the classroom. So each time you have one, you make one and then you share it with the rest of the classroom. So the students can see all of these um, specific words and uh, different roots that are meaning in math. Oh yeah, we can move on. That's just one example. But in another example of a tool you, we can use with the same problem, vocabulary, unknown vocabulary, is a knowledge assessment scale and lexicon. So it can be a personal lexicon for the students. When he, when, when he doesn't know a word, he just has to write it down, find a meaning with the dictionary. I mean, that's a simple strategy. And he has to, and I like this, it's the last column, unknown word, because he's never seen that word, uh, but he might have seen or heard it and just doesn't know what it means anymore. So that's like, he has like some familiarity with it. So I like this because it's not just like, you know it or you don't know it. It's also like, oh, I think I've heard this before, but I'm not sure what it means. So it kind of makes him, you know, feel that it's not that unfamiliar. Uh, Julie uh, is saying we also have to not be afraid to use muggle language to explain math terms. I like this. Still say the terms, but attach it to normal words so they remember them. I love this. Like I love also like the crocodile and knowledge. Denise earlier was, was talking about like elementary school, you know, images that they're using to actually make the students understand why not. Like uh, Giovanna was saying, it's a bit baby. Who cares if it brings back prior knowledge? Let's try it and then, you know, we can move on. So that's just some of the ideas this book presents, but they're amazing. Honestly, you can go on. Uh, Michelin, thank you. So uh, just, oh, yeah, I, I want to just add one thing. I, what I, I, I love in this technique, especially also that it could be done digitally. So this is done digitally. Uh, notice that the rectilinear here is highlighted. If the students, when they do the search, like this is one thing they can use like the digital technology to find, let's say, what it is. So if they click on it, they get to go to a site, to a link that explains it. So, you know, well, not this one, 
but uh, but what I'm trying to say that they have a link they could go in case they forgot. So they, they build their own dictionary. It has multiple purposes. Yeah, and, and it's great to link concepts, yes. Yeah, you're right. There's a like hypertext and you can click on it. And they were saying you can also do a classroom lexicon. So each students contribute to their classroom lexicon, but you know, it's online and everybody goes into like a, a shared documents and actually put links online with definition. Yeah, I like this idea. That's true. We talked about that. So yeah, so these are like a few ideas, but there's a lot of them. But why did I start with vocabulary? Because this is often what you need to start with. If the students doesn't understand the words, you're not going to be able to go on and actually move on on the task at all. So you really have to make sure that they understand what they're reading. Another thing, but I'm going to go fast on this one, is using the structure, the text structure, because complex tasks, I've said it many times in my slides before, it's built a certain way. So you might actually teach that to your students and it's gonna help them understand more the content. Surprisingly, you might say, why is the structure affecting you know, the content? Yes, because the student's gonna be to, able to recognize certain elements just from the structure of it. So it's gonna be familiar and it lessens the stress when reading a new task because something is familiar, it might just be, the structure, how it's presented, but this already helps. And I know that we, we've been asked before, like, can we teach something that are the, in the exams, either like syntax or vocabulary, but one thing we experimented in maths uh, in our centers at CSSME in the general education was actually because, you know, you make your own secondary one and secondary two exams in maths and even prior um, levels. So what we did, we, we redid our local exams and we chose a structure that would really help students with numbers and specific fonts and all of that. We really reworked like Michelin presented to be inclusive. And then the complex tasks presented in the classroom would follow that model, exactly the same format, okay? And we really noticed, and we didn't change the exam in the content just the way it was presented. And we really noticed that we had a higher, higher rate of success in the exams. And the only thing we changed was that we presented the format of the secondary one and secondary two exams to the students in the classroom, in their general, you know, day-to-day -day doing complex tasks in the classroom. And then when and we told them when they were, when you're gonna go to the exam, you know, doing the exam is gonna be the same format, just that lower the stress so much that what we analyzed you know that actually the success rate went higher a lot just but we didn't work the content anything just the format of it so that's why i wanted to talk to you about the structure of the text so we don't have as much control over sec three four and five but we do have a lot of control prior to that and also we can still present you know, a structure of the text that looks like what's in the exam, not the content, just how it's going to look. Where is the question going to be? How the information is going to be presented? Where is the image in the exam? It's always at the, uh, at the right. I'm going to do the same thing, you know, in my complex text in the, the classroom so they know how it's going to be presented. So that I think something that could, you know, really help the, the, the weaker readers and all of our learners. But this is something I'm very proud of, I just wanna say. We have four profiles of readers uh, in action. So that's something I'm very proud of because I took the theory and I divided it into four profiles. Um, and I think it's very visually, it helps us to understand. And I did two videos with Veronique Bernard back in the days, a few years ago, it must be four or five years ago about this. It's in French, but it's on YouTube. So we could still share the links, mission because if you look at the video, you can have the subtitle at the bottom without having the, the English version of it. But this is like a, a brief summary of what I said, is that there are four profile of readers. The first one is the hardest to work with, we're not going to lie, Denise, you probably know these, re these, these readers, these are weak readers, they are poor at decoding, and they are poor at comprehension. So it is very hard to uh, start working with them. But one project that we did in math and languages a few years ago, and that's the second video explained this, is that we really work on fluidity. 
So we had a lot of time we read with the students in French and in maths and with texts that were not just languages, they were also math texts and they would read out loud with someone guiding them often. Like I think it was 10, 15 minutes, uh, twice a day. Like it was very often we had them reading out loud and we helped them and we modeled this and we really see like a huge uh, like improvement in the literacy level. So this was done for a year with very weak reader, but that really made a difference. And that was a project that was done uh, through the different uh, adult general education. So it's really for our you know, students. So this is, I'm not gonna lie, this is hard when the students are you know, very weak readers, but we can still work on that. And we're gonna start with fluidity and vocabulary. That's you know, the, the first step. We have another profile and it's when, like, I, I hope I'm not doing this sort of backward, but it's good at decoding and poor at comprehension. So this one, yeah, okay, <laughs> I'm following my own order, that's good. <laughs> so uh, when he's good at decoding, he can read easily and he can decode the words. He understands, like he's gonna recognize the word and identify all the words, but he's gonna have a hard time understanding one of the reasons, and Giovanna is going to talk to you about that, is that it might be a translation issue with the students for the First Nations, from the First Nations or the immigrants, their mother tongue is not English. So it's a different language. So just that, the comprehension may be, might be just language issue, but it might also be just a comprehension issue. And then you really have to work with different strategies and tools to actually be able to, let's say, make the, the students make inferences and different stuff. So there's some explicit teaching of the strategies to be put in place. And then we have this, that cases, I like it a lot. Poor at decoding and good at comprehension. Why do I like it a lot? It's actually that it's often we think they're poor at decoding and poor at comprehension because since they're not decoding right, very often it's it stops there. If we leave them with the text, it's gonna stop there. We're gonna be, oh, this is a weak reader. We have to work on everything with this reader. But the truth is not that. The truth is that, is that if we do the same task early, he would be able to do it. Then I would understand, oh no, his comprehension is very good. The problem is decoding. And if the problem is decoding, I'm just gonna work on decoding. I'm not gonna work on everything. And in math, I could work early for a while in order to, for him to build his skills in maths. So that's something to actually keep in mind. And then, like there's also you know a, a strong reader and then hooray because we have a lot of work we know that <laughs> with all of our you know readers with different uh skills levels that are good at decoding and good at comprehension and then you can work with michelin and improve the math skills right away and go full on in math <laughs> so you can really push this but that being said this is something that Giovanna is gonna come back with uh, because she's gonna introduce, uh, introduce us to an amazing tool that's not gonna fix all of the problems that might, but that, well, yeah, but that might really be useful and keep in mind these four profiles. So we're gonna look at a couple of ways that you can use immersive reader to support some of the strategies that you've seen here today, including decoding and comprehension, okay? So I'll be doing a demonstration of, thank you, Ms. Lynn. Uh, you can go to the next slide directly. So I'll be doing a demonstration of how you can use um, the immersive reader in three different spaces, okay? So how, um, well, it's not you use it, but how the students can use the immersive reader uh, with their cell phones in a learning management system and directly on the web, okay? So you don't need to show all of these. You don't need to know all of the ways uh, I'm just presenting all, what's possible today. You're going to choose the situation that best serves your reality. It's kind of like what Michelin was saying before, trained in many ways. So um, that's it. You're going to choose the ways that, that works for you. And don't worry about taking notes or any of that stuff uh, because the Shrihishaf compiles all of the resources, including the PowerPoint. There's going to be a resource that includes um, videos um, with like what you what I will have explained today. Uh, there's also a step-by-step -step PowerPoint presentation uh, that was created by Louise Roy, like um, Michelin mentioned before, that was translated by Jessica. So again, thank you, Jessica. And all of this will be added in the collaborative document. And on top of that, if there is anything that you see that you want 
support with directly in your classrooms, reach out to me. It will be my pleasure to come and do this with you, for you, with your students, however you like, okay? So the takeaway from this is these are not like, it's great for you to, you know, to show these to your students, but there, you, you, I don't ex like the, the expectation is not that you know them in depth and you have like another added burden to your shoulders. Know that these tools exist, point your students in this direction. And if you don't even feel like doing the show and tell, call me, I'm gonna come in virtually and show this with your students. Ça marche? Right, okay. So let's start with what is an immersive reader? Can I get a little answer in the chat? All right, I'm gonna tell you because we're running out of time. So <laughs> immersive reader is basically, it's uh, a tool that allows you to listen to the text using text-to-speech technology, okay? So what Michelin was talking about before that read aloud, rereads, have somebody else read it to them. So it allows for this, um, this, this, this opportunity, right? This, this, this support. Um, so it uses proven techniques to help people read more effectively, increase comprehension, what Vanessa was talking about before, and fluidity. I want to invite you, if you know your Apple ID or your Google uh, credentials, if you want to follow along with me, I invite you to do so. And I'll show you how to customize one or two uh, immersive readers and the customizable features are the same. So I'm just going to show you the nuance difference with the different tools. Okay. But you'll see that the, the tools, they, they're, they're very, um, the customizable features re, uh, repeat themselves. They're exactly the same in, in any immersive reader. So it makes for easy transfer for the student. Okay. So the first tool that we're going to look at is uh, lens. So in order to do that, I'm going to go to, you see my children, look at that. So I'm going to go to the app store. I'm going to open up my app store. And again, like I said, if you know your credentials, follow along. Otherwise, sit back, relax, enjoy the show. So I'm going to go in my search bar. I am going to type lens. Okay. And it isn't the first one. You're going to recognize it. It has the logo of an old school camera lens, okay? I'm going to go back. You're going to see get, okay? I already have it, so I'm going to open mine. Once you're going to hit get, you're going to be prompted to um, enter your username and password. So I'm going to go ahead and open mine. And now, okay, discard this. So what I've done is I've taken a uh, I've taken a page out of the SOFAD book just for this demonstration because immersive readers don't usually read PDFs, but Lens is so sexy and that it does. Now, if you look at the top right of my screen, you see this little button here that I've in it lets me adjust the border after each scan because as you can see, I the picture was horrible. So now I adjust my borders, I can confirm. And it has other features, but for today, we're only going to look at the immersive reader, okay? Again, if you want more help with uh, the extensive features of Lens, just call me. Now, the student has the option to export to um, a bunch of um, files, but we're gonna look at the immersive reader today. So it's the second last option from the bottom. So I'm going to click on immersive reader. All right. And now I can have my text read. But before I do that, I just want to show you something. If I click, this isn't the one. I've already enabled the picture dictionary. So we were talking before about multiple representations. This is already one way to support the students. All right, now let's go back to see the tool read aloud. 
So I simply click on that little button, the little uh, triangle at the bottom, and it begins reading. So far, only bounded polygons of constraints have been presented. Now, <clears throat> we can customize the reader. Well, the student can customize, right? So there are a few ways that we can customize. So if we click on the little gear next to it, we can adjust for voice speed. So if we go towards the bunny, it can be quicker. Towards the, th the turtle, it's a little bit slower. We can adjust for female or male voice. Just for this demonstration, I'm going to change. And we can further customize. If we look at the top right of the screen, we have three little lines. If we click on that, we have other ways that we can customize the text. Now, uh, you, won't look, you won't see in real time how we customize the text simply because I'm using this on the phone. But in the next uh, like demonstration, you'll be able to see in real time how the text is affected. So the student can uh, play with the sizing of the text, like we looked at before, like increase the point size. We can play with the line spacing for more comfort, play with the font, and uh, various uh, themes, which is essentially the background. And again, here there's like, there's no right or wrong way, right? It's the comfort of the student. In the next tab, we see the grammar features. What we were looking at before was isolating, for example, for syllables. So the student can identify a root word, a prefix, a suffix. In that sense, the, uh, the um, word is broken up and the student has uh, support in decoding the word. The student can also isolate four parts of speech. Now, of course, this is you know, usually adopted by uh, language teachers, but we saw how if we isolate, for example, for the verbs, the student can go and look for these words, also helping them decode the text. The last tab, we have um, what we call line focusing. And this, we can limit the focus from one line to two lines of text to five. Oops, well, it's not allowing me on the phone. It's also five lines of text, OK? And what this does is limits the distraction of other texts. Some students require this, and it's nice for them to know that this is possible. I don't want it right now for this simulation. My phone is not responding. OK. Uh, we also can, if, if the picture dictionary is distracting, we don't have to put it. I think it's, um, I think it's practical. My phone is not cooperating. I apologize. But we simply can enable or disable it. And what the feature that uh, Vanessa was referring to before is this uh, translate feature. Notice how many languages uh, that the student can translate in. And you know, for students, like we said, that uh, they, they are poor decoders. Uh, sorry, yeah, poor, dec poor decoders, but good, that, no, sorry, good decoders, bad comprehension. It can be that it's a second language issue. So the student can just select the text in, uh, sorry, select to translate in their desired language and they can translate by word or by document. So in this case, for this demonstration, I'm gonna do it by document. And if we go back, we'll notice that it's quite accurate. Vous trouverez ci-dessous une situation où il sera illimité. So while I was doing the um, simulation for this, I tried different languages. I tried it in Greek. I tried it in Italian. I tried it. We tried it in Arabic with Michelin. It's very accurate. So um, and it's very practical for us as well. Like imagine, like I'm gonna I'm gonna use this personally. Like if I travel and I end up in an airport somewhere, I am never going to worry about not understanding anything because I'm going to point to the airport signs. I know what I'm doing. Uh, the street signs, a menu, I can read it because I have this handy dandy tool in my, uh, in my possession. And I think this one is the most versatile. If you're going to teach one thing to your students, I think it should be this. But I'm looking at you, so it looks like I'm not, but I'm looking at you. So I'm gonna show you, um, so we did the phone. I, this is my tool of preference simply because 
uh, it's always in the hands of the learners. We don't have to worry whether or not they have the, the technology or not, or if you're in a learning management system or not. This is my tool of choice. However, if we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at the second space, which is the learning management spaces. And once again, I am going to share my screen. So the next uh, space that we're gonna look at is learning management systems. And <laughs> it's gonna be fun. We're gonna see this one. So uh, Louise's suggestion, I'm gonna just preface this, was that we um, convert a PDF. To, so we're looking at the SOFAD book, right? I need to like uh, reculer un peu. So the idea was if a student is, if you're working with the SOFAD books and the student needs an immersive reader, you can take the PDF, convert it, put it into Word and use the immersive reader. Now, in order to do that, there's, there's a video explaining how to do that. But in order to do that, you need to have um, Word, a desktop version of Word. Okay, so it is possible to do that. You have a desktop version of Word and you can put it into Word. I think that if you're gonna go the PDF route, this is the easiest route to do it, lands a C2. However, if you're going to the Age Resources website and you're selecting a learning situation that already exists and there is no PDF conversion necessary, you take that learning situation, that's a complex task, take it, copy, paste it into a Word document. So now I am going to share my screen again to do that lovely, that lovely tutorial. All right. So you see my screen, right? You see my, uh, again, I, I did the exercise of already copy pasting it in. So all I've done, it was really the exercise was I took the uh, complex task from the uh, age resources site and I just copy and pasted it in so that it was ready for this demonstration. And in order to select the immersive reader, I'm going to go to my top ribbon Okay, all the way up here. I'm going to select the view tab and I'm going to engage the immersive reader. And just like that, I am able to have it. I'm going to just click on it, read aloud. There are three islands, island A, island B, island C. Okay, now in this uh, simulation, you'll be able to see in real time how the text changes. I do wanna bring your attention to the fact that we have, like I said before, the picture dictionary allows for multiple representation. I'm just going where I think there would be like, because it wouldn't like, what's the representation of this, right? But the nouns generally have uh, more data, right? More support, all right? So the same thing we customize in the same way, as you can see, these ones are, are backend text, so you won't see them in real time. I'm going to adjust it just slightly so that we can see the difference. Uh, just, I'm gonna go slower. And I'm gonna make it a male just so that we can see the simulation later. And same thing, right? We saw these text features before. And again, I'll just do the simulation so you can see how the text changes in real time. And it's the same thing. We can adjust for background. Like if it were me, this is my comfort level. I'm dyslexic, I'm an atypical student. For me, this is the way I like to see it. However, I'm gonna put it in the neutral position. Again, the, um, see you, the student can isolate for the syllables and various parts of speech. You know, and, and this support as well is like, like it's really when we teach the other reading strategies, this in itself could support those strategies while breaking up the word and all that. And finally, the line focus. Well, like I mentioned before, picture dictionary. And I want to change language. Can I have a, a suggestion of language? Oh, no. You have Spanish in the chat. 
Spanish, Park, perfect. Vamos. Uh, okay, let's go Latin America. I'm choosing that one. I made an executive decision. I'm gonna remove the, um, the parts of speech because I don't want it to break it up. And if we go back, you're gonna have to validate if, if the uh, translation is accurate. Hay tres islas, Isla A, Isla B, Isla C, en el sur del Océano Pacífico. So can you validate that the translation is quite accurate? Uh, Yes, it is. Sorry? Yes, it is. It is, huh? So like that's the, uh, the, the, the beauty, like we tried, like I said, we tried with, uh, with different languages and it was, it was quite surprising at how accurate the, uh, the translation is. All right, all right. So the second tool I'm gonna show you is, uh, let me get out of this, is OneNote. Okay, so I don't know if some of you are using OneNote. Again, my spaces are already uh, prepared for this exercise. Again, whatever you see, if there's anything that you are, would like support with, just feel free in reaching out. So my page is already prepared for this exercise. And it's not Michelin Amar that I want, I want my word problem. So I did the same thing. I simply copy and paste it in the problem that I accessed from the age resources site. And since it's Microsoft, it's the exact same thing. If I want to engage the um, immersive reader, I simply go to the top, my top ribbon, I uh, access the view tab, and there the immersive reader is now um, in the first position, the first tab, and I click on the immersive reader, so it's the same thing. I don't need to go through all of... There are three of, islands. I don't need to go through every single tool. I will just show you that they are transferable. Once the student has access to, like learns one and knows how to manipulate one, the transfer is very easy for any immersive reader. So whether they're doing it on their phone and, or maybe you're using um, the notebook and the OneNote in class. Uh, so once they use one, they can easily use the other. I do want to bring your attention to if you are using the one. Is anyone using the OneNote? Give me a. I don't see you, and I don't see the chat. Is anyone? You, Julie Valley in this in the chat said she, there are some of us are using Google Read Write. Ah, uh, okay. So you're using Read Write. Okay, so that's the extension. So you're with Google. So for those that if you're not using OneNote, it's it's irrelevant. But I'm going to show you what it what it does. What's possible because it is fun to use OneNote in the sense where students can complete their tasks directly in their, in their notebook, in their OneNote, right? So again, it's going to the PDF example. So in this case, I took the same problem. I put it into uh, the OneNote in, 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 in the background, right, in PDF. So this is, the student would be able to enter the answer directly on their one note, uh, in their one note, right? However, that's practical, but not for the immersive reader. Okay, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. So if you're already using Read Write, you know that Google, how sexy, and I love Google. The problem with Google is that it doesn't have a an immersive reader integrated. All right, so it it's not an immersive reader, but there are still things that you can do to uh, make the document ac not accessible, but you can support some of these strategies um, with some of the features that Google um, has, okay? So <clears throat> same thing, same problem, same space. I took it and I did not copy it in this case because uh, it's already in a .x format. But what I did was I saved it to my drive and I'm gonna show you why I did that. Okay, in Google, it's not in the view tab, all right? It's in the tools tab. In the tools tab, there are ways that we can have the students either translate the document, which is also quite accurate. I'm not gonna do it now because I would think we're running out of time. So I'm gonna say that again. So the student can translate the document. So that's interesting for the input. That it can also voice type 
their answer. So that's cool for the output. And they can also have the document read to them. And for that, they need to engage the accessibility features and you need to turn screen reader support. And once you have screen reader support, you need to um, add uh, an add-on. In this case, you guys have read write uh, to be able to have this screen reader support for the students. Okay. In my case, I chose um, I chose read aloud, and it was great for a couple of seconds. And then you need to install this. the read aloud Google Workspace. And then it gave me this uh, prompt, and it the information goes to a third party. So you need to gauge your comfort level with how you want to which uh, which uh, add on you feel comfortable with working with. Okay. Okay, and the last one I want to show you. Now we're going to go into the web space. Uh, oh, sorry. I wanted to show you why I put it in the drive. This is the document that I got from the uh, Age Resources site. Notice that it's in DocX. When I hit the Tools button, when I click on the Tools button, I don't have the option to translate. Okay, so sometimes you just have to pay attention to the format of the document, because that might impact the features that you have access to. And finally, I am going to show you how to use the immersive reader on a website. So be true to form. We want, I selected the um, age uh, resources website, uh, sorry, the age website. And um, I have selected uh, the Immersive Reader, Chrome Immersive Reader add-on. So in order to use it, we simply click on the text that we want read. So click, drag, we drag the, we drag and select the text that we want read. And then we right click on it. And then we have the prompt, help me read this. And at this point, an Immersive Reader shows up. And it's the exact same. Le Chuck Pedagogical is a team of consultants mandated. It's Le Chuck. Maybe that's the only thing that is uh, different. But like my secondary one math teacher, Mr. Sbarra, I used to say, and that's the way you go about it. That's how, that was my introduction to high school math. That's the way you go about it. So I think that's, see too, Lisa, me. Any questions, comments? Uh, this I thought it was like super amazing, even though like I heard this and I'm hearing this and it's always brand new, like usual, Giovanna. <laughs> it's always new to me. Thank you. Um, so this brings us to the end of our uh, today's presentation and hopefully we'll be to continue on March 31st of the conversation. So hopefully by the end of today, you're able to have a better understanding of the uh, reading strategy and what applies to mathematics, and also to be aware of some digital resources that may help you and help your students. Um, that brings us to please also pencil it in, uh, March 31st, same place, same time. Uh, and that's it, that's all. So if you guys have any questions, any comment, uh, Oh, one more thing before I, I, I wish you a great day. Um, we, we, we are throwing an invitation out there. Whoever would like to kind of have these uh, resource, uh, these uh, strategy implemented there in their centers, if they want us to follow a group of students where we're gonna implement and we could like kind of bring it in for next uh, workshop, like just like a clips on how, what works, what didn't work as feedback. If you're interested to participate in that small action research uh, kind of uh, practice, you'll have access to three, uh, three professionals who will be at your disposal to implement these strategies uh, and help you follow up uh, with it, just to see, uh, to get your feedback on it so we could bring in in real lifetime uh, the application. So if this is something of, of interest to you, please let us know. Uh, so, and we'll contact you. Other than that, uh, I would like to thank you all for being here. This, this, uh, this, is, uh, this is a topic that is dear to our heart that we wanted to share with everybody. Hope we helped everybody. 
and I would like to thank uh, dearly my uh, my uh, co-host Vanessa and Giovanna for uh, and and Richard of course uh, we can't do without him for uh, for uh, for all their hard work and I wish you a beautiful beautiful end of days and stay safe. <laughs>